All right. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Are you awake? Uh, okay. Ah, come on. Half awake, half yeah. awake. All right, <laughs> we'll, we'll make you awake, hopefully. Um, so today we're going to talk about, about, we are going to talk about Kafka, and not only for the developer, and I think who is mainly a developer here? Okay. Um, yeah, it's DevOps. Talks, okay. Who is mainly an operation person here? <laughs> okay, not a lot. And who is doing both? DevOps. Okay, oh, nice. all right, good, good nice. mix. So this is a good presentation to see both sides. And the good thing is, if you fall asleep, don't, right? But if you fall asleep, the good thing is, uh, these are like 10 to 15 minutes conversation, and then we swap to another subject. So if you fall asleep, just take your nap, go back up, and then you're ready for an, the next topic, OK? So my name is Emmanuel Bernard. I work at Red Hat as a distinguished engineer, and I've been working on Quarkus and on Hibernate. And the new thing I'm working on, I'll mention in a minute. And my name is Clément Escoffier. I'm also working uh, at Red Hat. I'm doing mostly Quarkus, uh, a lot of things around messaging and the integration of messaging within Quarkus. So while Emmanuel is going to present the ops side, I'm going to dig into the dev side of Kafka and a lot of things that most developers using Kafka didn't realize until it's too late. <laughs> you doomed people. All right, um, quick disclaimer, because we might just take the shortcut saying Kafka, but the full name is Apache, Apache Kafka, Kafka, so there you go. Um, and that presentation is born out of the two experiences, right? The one from Clément, which has worked on client-side Kafka integration with Quarkus and other platforms, rewriting some of the Kafka clients, helping fixing bugs on those, and so on. So we learned a lot you know, on the, on the dev side and how the application should behave and interact. And the other side is um, uh, Red Hat is doing cloud services. Who knew? Exactly, right? Not enough people. <laughs> so we have uh, a set of services like uh, a Kubernetes as a service, but also a Kafka as a service. And we learned to operate it ourselves and for our customers, right? So we got a 24-7 SRE team and so on. And we learned a lot about how to operate the system, and that's the experience we wanted to share with you. So you can try it. Uh, there is like a 24-hour trial period like you can try a small instance for it. So go for rodat.com slash Kafka if you're interested. This is all of the subjects we're going to talk about. So small recipe where we focus on one subject, and then we move forward. OK? And I think we're ready for you. Yep. All right, so let's get started with, again, the dev side. And we are going to start how do I share? Yeah, here. Um, with the simple side, the producer side, and partitioners. So Kafka, when you are a developer and you, you discover Kafka and you want to use it because it's pretty trendy, it's a good skills to add on your resume, um, and you look at the different page and getting started and say, well, it's relatively simple, right? So basically, what do I have? I have a producer, fine, which is going to send records, we will see what it is, uh, to a topic. All right. This topic is basically a queue in which we will store the records. This queue is actually divided into what we call partitions. Oh, things start to be a little bit different from what we are using with GMS or IMQP or RabbitMQ. On the other side, I have a consumer which is going to subscribe to several topics and retrieve polls, actually, records from the partitions. Consumers are organized in consumer group. OK, fine. A little bit different, but we can still manage it. Under partition, we have more the upside side of things. So what happens in the broker? So the partitions are actually stored into replicas. And each partition can have one, two, multiple replicas. Replicas will be running in different machines, different brokers. One will be the leader, where you write. And the other will be the follower. So in case of a disaster, you can still recover relatively smoothly. A set of brokers from a cluster, and so on. So we have this image, and you say, yeah, OK, that's fine. I can build an application with this. There is no problem. So, But 
again, at the center of Kafka, we have records. Records is a key value pair. Um, and it's relatively simple to, to represent so key value. Um, the key can be null. The value can be null. Both the key and the value can be null, even if I didn't find any use case for that. It's possible. Um, you can have a set of headers. It's optional, but it can be useful. We will see uh, later how we can use them. And it has a timestamp um, that is added automatically if you are not adding one. So, and basically, in terms of code, you are going to, produ to, uh, to create producer record on the producer side with my topic, my key, and some payload. So here my key is a string, and my payload is a string. It can be any type. Uh, I can omit the key, so the key will be null. Uh, and on the consumer side, we poll records. So they are not producer records, they are records. So it's basically an immutable copy of your records where you can get the key value and all the other metadata. OK, fine. These records have written to partitions. While they target a topic, they are not written into a topic, they are written into a partition. Uh, partitions are logs. So logs, they are append-only uh, structures, uh, which will be replicated between your uh, leader and your followers. Once written in a partition, your record has two more metadata. One is a partition, which is an integer starting from 0 to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And an offset, which is a long. Um, and if you have the topic, the partition ID, and the offset, you can identify a specific record that has been written. The offset being, uh, well, as we see on this picture over there, oh, that doesn't work. Uh, first offset, uh, uh, zero, uh, zero is the first, and, and, and so on and so on. And you write, you always happen like this. So. A topic can be seen as a group of partitions, of logical group of partitions. Uh, it can have one partition, that's a minimum, or several partitions. And a record, as I said, can be uniquely identified using topic partition offsets. But don't forget replicas, because what you may find using this uh, tuple um, might be a replicas of the initial records. But for you, you don't care. It's fine, right? As soon as the replicas has been updated, you're good. We are going to use this class a lot, topic partitions, which is just a pair of topic and partitions. So you will see that in, 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 in the code we will write. So that's why I mention it here. Yeah. Sorry, by the way, Kafka is not that old. Like you're using cassettes and No, CDs. we are like old. Kafka is not that old. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, so how to create a producer. So it's relatively simple. So Kafka. Um, the Kafka Bear API, not the one that you use in, in framework and things like that, uh, use a map string object for configuration. So it can be, can be weird, especially when we are used to properties or YAML or things a little bit more uh, typed. But yeah, that's what they used. It's actually very powerful because, well, it's not really typed. So you, to create a producer, you will say, OK, I need to say where is my Kafka broker. So that's the first property, bootstrap.server config. Um, then I need to set the serializer for my key and my value. So the serializer is the piece of code, we will see how to implement one later, that will take your object and write bytes, generate bytes, because what we'll write is byte arrays. So it's basically this. As you can imagine, on the consumer side, we have deserializers. Um, and when you want to write, you do producer.send, you produce a record with a topic, your key, and your value. It returns a future, a future of record metadata. Oh, is that asynchronous? Yeah, kind of, but not totally. Because basically, under the hood, when you do this single line of code, send, that's what's happening. Your producer called send, then the first thing you will do is wait for on metadata. Um, that it will fetch from the cluster. This metadata will tell the producer, well, if the partition exists, who is the leader of that partition? Because that's, uh, uh, for all partitions, it will find the leaders. Then it will call the serializers, instantiate and call the serializers for the key and the value. 
these serializers can be blocking or non-blocking. Or they, if they do I.O. or they are blocking. Then, and we are going to see this, uh, this code a little bit into more details after that, it's the partitioners. The partitioners will find or will uh, compute which partitions you need to write to. Because in my send, I didn't say which partitions. So the producer needs to say, okay, I have that records, where do I need to write to that one? Then it will push this to a record accumulator. The record accumulator is a set of buffers, what we call batch, of topic partitions. And um, this, this is made to write by batch and not one by one, because one by one would be way too slow. So we accumulate a number of records before we send them to the second part of the producer, which is this IO thread over there. This IO thread is asynchronous, in the sense that it's something that is pulling constantly the uh, topic and partitions, and when one of the uh, batch is full, we'll take it, send it to the right partition leader, wait for the message to say that it's completed, so it's using ePoll, uh, and then um, uh, when everything is fine, it will send the record metadata. What's important is that the second part is asynchronous, and explain why send return the futures. But this first part here, is totally synchronous. So it's not because it wrote on a future that it's not blocking. It's actually, only the second part is not blocking. The first part is totally blocking and you can block. So, and it can block a very, very, very long time. We will see that inside the demo. It's, it can be almost forever. Um, another important thing is that the producer can be called from any thread, which is not the case of the consumer, so we will see this. Um, how does Kafka know where to write? Well, as I said, it will pick the partitioners and the partitioner will compute the partition where we need to write that uh, record. By default, uh, it uses a hash of the key. That's great. We have a key, we get a hash of the key. Except that, I said, key can be null. So in that case, instead of writing always to the same partition, which would be completely nonsense, it will actually uh, count the number of records written for one partition, and then uh, go to the next one, and then go to the next one. So that means that it's better to use null key than constant key. And it's oh, one of the mistakes we, we are seeing a lot. For the balancing, at least. Yeah, for the balancing. So all your partitions get almost the same number of records. Yeah. But then there are like business reasons to put a key. So there is some alignment yep. in ordering that would uh, work on. I don't know if you discuss that later. Yeah, ordering will be on the later. with a retry, yes. Um, so you can customize your partition strategy and it can be useful if you have business requirements where you absolutely want to have this set of keys going to the same partitions for ordering logics or because you want to replay for, for, for this kind of, uh, um, of keys. So in that case, you have two choices. You can do manual assignments, and when you do send, pass the partitions you want to write to, or write your own partitioners. Um, if you don't set your own partitioners, you will use the default partitioner. And in the case of null, it's what they use, sticky partition, so it's accumulate a number of records to one partition and then switch to the next one. All right, so let's switch to some code now. Um, first thing, very simple. I'm going to uh, write some record just to see how it works. So I do send new producer records, that's my topic, that's my value, this one has a key, and so on. So if I go back there, where is my mouse here? So I, I don't actually don't have a Kafka broker running because I'm using Quarkus, so it will start one for me, uh, but later we will use a, a specific one. So it's written. And if I go to see my broker, so this is HKHQ, oops. If I don't start it, it doesn't work. Okay. So there is plenty of UI for, uh, for, for Kafka. Uh, that one is not the best, uh, but it's uh, easiest to get running and get start with. A call uh, is probably much better, but harder to, to start with. So that's what we see. We have two topics. Um, if I go there, I have this one as uh, two records, one with a key key and one with no key. They have both been written to the partition zero. Why? 
because I didn't create any partitions. So there is a single partitions, which will always be zero if I don't create a partitions beforehand. Um, that's it for this. If I go back to my code and I, oops, where is this? Go back here. And I want to do something a little bit more uh, uh, fancy. So I'm going to create a topic with three partitions this time and then write to uh, the partitions by setting the partitions in my producer record. So I can set that 0, 1, 2. And now if I do this. Yes. Oops, uh, I need to go back here because I create two. Yes, two uh, multi partition topics. So I have three partitions because I created them, is what I said. And now if I go back here, I say that I get one record in the partition zero, one, and two. And the result of the send operation, so these futures, will return the metadata which contains the topics, the partitions, the offsets, and other stuff, but that's are important things. So that's relatively simple. Now let's now look at the partitioner part. So that's more or less exactly the same thing. I have a set of uh, stuff to write. In that case, it's people, um, it's person, well, people. Uh, and I will just write that with the regular uh, producers using the default partitioner. So if I go back here. Okay, restart the broker. Oh, they have been written, and you see, uh, so Anakin has been written in the partition 2, Luke in the partition 0, Obi-Wan 1, uh, Jar Jar Bins 2, and uh, Leila in partition 0. This is the default partitioner using Murmur, uh, Murmur 32. And the reason is, it's because I have a key, which is the first name of my person. If I would have been used, uh, uh, if I would have been used null, they will all have been written to the same partition because the batch is more than the number of records. So now if I go back here and I change that to use my own partitioner. So a partitioner is something very simple. It's a class that implements the partitioner interface. And in that case, uh, we will configure our producers with a partition class config, which tell which class you want to use as a partitioner. So that's the only thing you need to add. Um, and, oops, sorry. and the partitioner so will be used, and then a partitioner is called with the topic, the key object. It doesn't know what kind of key it's used. The serialized uh, version of the key, because it has to be serialized. Same thing for the value, so the payload, the serialized variant of the payload, and the cluster. This cluster here is actually very uh, important because it gives you the possibility to contact the cluster and get metadata from the cluster in a fully blocking manner. So you can block until you get enough metadata from the cluster. So here my partitioner is very simple. Don't do that. So if it's a uh, um, instance of strings, and yeah, it, um, if it's not an instance of string, we say no, we need an instance of string, it must not be blanked. And then I do some very weird logic like if the first letter is less than i, then I'll return zero. If it's less than r, then I'll return one. And in the other case, I return two. So if I go back here and I start this, we'll see what would be written. Boom, so now we have Anakin on zero, Luke on one, Obi-Wan on one, Jar Jar Bins on one, and Leila on one, because we have no one with uh, R. So now, let's imagine that I do a mistake in my partitioners, and I'm calling, I'm targeting a partition that does not exist, because I created my topic partitions with three partitions, and the three means the fourth partitions. In that case, if I want to write, it's going to be stuck. Waiting that the partitions get created, potentially forever. This is kind of annoying. So when you write a partitioner, be very, very careful that the partition you are targeting actually exists. 
or will be created in an uh, uh, acceptable amount of time. Generally, make sure that they exist. That's why they pass the cluster object, so you can retrieve the existing partitions at the moment of the core and be sure to target one of these partitions. That doesn't mean that if someone on the admin side, like Emmanuel, start deleting partitions blindly, well, you will be in trouble. That's a race condition, but yeah, you are, cannot do more about that. So be very, very careful with this. This is something that happens a lot more than people believe. Oh, and yeah, as you can see, there is absolutely no log, nothing that tells you that that's a problem. Welcome in the Kafka world. <laughs> All right, so let's switch to the next topic now. By the way, you said that Jar Jar Bing was uh, qualified as people. I think there is debate over that one. <laughs> Jar Jar Binks is the best Star Wars characters ever. Okay. I want to go back alive, so <laughs> let's, let's not have this debate. So, all right, so <coughs> Clement started a, so he uses a dev service in Quarkus to auto start a Kafka locally in his machine, but let's set up the Kafka for our production. Uh, so what do we mean by settings? So first of all, Kafka has the notion of broker, and there is more than one because it's a distributed system. And this is really, a broker is really where you store the messages. That, that's where your data is. Okay, fine. And then there is a metadata piece aspect to it, like, you know, what are the topic names and stuff like that. And this is stored in a metadata store. In this case, this is Zookeeper because uh, Zookeeper embraces the... Uh, the RAF protocol, I believe that's the RAF protocol. Um, that's uh, the classical Kafka and most of the deployment are there. There is a new mode where Zookeeper has been replaced by uh, an own implementation by the Kafka team. Uh, it's called Craft, Craft being a variant of the, the, Kaf the RAF protocol. So, but whether you use Zookeeper or Kafka controllers, which are special nodes or special instance of node that do this, there is the that data and the metadata. So you need to deploy this, do that configuration, that's your installation. But that's not enough. Once you've installed, it's not install and forget, right? Um, think about the day two, day three sort of activities, right? So first of all, how do you upgrade from one version to another? Are you fine shutting everything down or do you want to keep it up and have a rolling update that is uh, smoothless? Are you accepting some degradation or not, right? How do you scale when you realize you're at the limit? Uh, is it by adding CPU, like a beefer machine, adding memory? Is it by adding disks? Or is it by adding nodes, like more brokers, to deal with it, right? How do you rebalance those sort of things? Of course, how do you secure? Uh, hopefully, these days, nobody just leave their system up in the open. Um, and balance is really... Um, how do you find that uh, the cluster is behaving in a, in a normal way? Is, is there a broker like holding some of the very hot partitions that needs to be uh, rebalanced across the various brokers? So there is a lot of aspects of setting up that are just beyond the initial installation. So in our case, we've used, uh, we're, we're deploying on Kubernetes uh, because Kubernetes is to us a very nice abstraction and gives some primitives that are very useful to be able to deploy on one cloud, another cloud, or on-prem uh, in a useful manner, right? So first of all, it's a pool of resource, you know, faster than a, a VM, like you just say, I want this stuff to happen. And also it defines uh, primitives uh, that allows you to decide whether a given process should run alongside another one or very far away from it. By very far away from it, I mean maybe it's another physical node, Maybe it's another physical availability zone which, or a different rack or things like that. So these are two useful things. The third one is the concept of operator, which is let's take how a human would deal with the problems and write it in code and automate that process. And that's, that is called Streamzy, which is part, it's a CNCF project. Uh, so cloud native, comp what, what is CNCF? Cloud native. We said it at the beginning in one of the slides. Yeah, that's, that's fair. <laughs> they have to follow. Um, sorry, I lost my thing. Uh, so yeah, so Streamzy is, is, a, is an operator you can, you know, that you run on top of Kubernetes that deals with the Kafka. So it's sort of the, 
the GitOps for your Kafka. So you express an intent to have a Kafka of like n number of workers and that configuration and that. And that's your intention. And I really love the notion of intent-based API for a distributed system. You say, here is what I want to have. And it's really a ve very close to the GitOps notion. Here is what I want to have. Deal with it, right? Um, and the operator is looking at that intent. So let's say you, I'm adding, asking for a new Kafka. So the operator regularly looks and says, OK, well, he's asking for this new Kafka. Let me observe what he's asking for analyze you know, what I should do, and maybe it's like create new lower level intent in Kubernetes, like, hey, I want to add a, a persistence volume, I want to add those five deployments and stuff like that, I want this configuration file, and then I execute. And maybe I'm also having some interaction with Kafka to know about the, whether it behaves correctly or not. Um, if I change my Kafka, then the intent is different from the reality, and the operator, his job is to take the intent and change the reality, it's like the matrix. They change the reality to match the intent, right? And in a distributed system, there's something you shouldn't forget, like nothing go right. At some point, something will go wrong. So operator is a brutal model where they, not only do they, they are invent-based and say, well, there is this change, let me go and apply something, but also every n seconds, it looks over all of the intents and say, is the reality still matching that intent? And if it's not, a change will happen. Okay? So it's, it's very brutal, but it works perfectly, and it's very safe and robust for a distributed system. Kubernetes is heavily using that sort of pattern. Okay, so what is the, the contract inside, uh, I mean, for Streamzy? So <clears throat> it's called a custom resource in Kubernetes, so that's you know, YAML-based descriptions of your intent. And not only can you create a Kafka cluster, but also, you know, Kafka Connect, which is the infrastructure and how you, I mean, one of the way into how to connect to the Kafka and distribute the load. Connectors being, I don't know, like putting the events into an Elasticsearch, so you get an Elasticsearch connector, or it could be a change data capture system that would, like Debezium, that would listen to the change of a database and put data into Kef Kafka. Mirror Maker is about copying. Kafka Bridge, a bit less known in the Kafka ecosystem, but if for some reason you cannot really reach Kafka with the native protocol and you need an HTTP-based solution between a faraway client and the Kafka, the bridge is here for that. Kafka Rebalance, we'll mention that a bit in the, in the, later in the conversation, but it's how to make the, the cluster behave a bit more homogeneously. And topics and users is how you describe those. So these are resource intentions that you uh, can express. So I'll zoom on to a couple of things. So if you look at the first quarter of the, the, uh, uh, the code here, you see rack topology key equals uh, Kubernetes zone. And that's how you say, let me express how I want to spread my various brokers. They need to be in different zones because if one of the zones dies in my cloud provider, I want to survive, right? So I've distributed my data across several zones, let's say three. If one zo zone dies, I can do that. So that's the matching I was talking about between the topology of the deployment and Kubernetes. If you deploy stuff in a single data center and you isolate by rack, that you would, that's the sort of zone you would use. The rack would be the different zones. Another one, which is at the bottom quarter of the, the, the code here, is the quota. So here, what I'm saying is, I will restrict the amount of re, uh, uh, volume of bytes coming in and coming out for a given user, right? And I'm limit, limiting it so that it, it doesn't overflow the system for other users, right? There is a backdoor, you see the exclude principle name list, and here there is a canary something. Well, Keep that in mind, we'll mention that a bit later. The other stuff we limit is the amount of space a person is using. Because if you go about you know, too much bandwidth, then you're, have, you're making the other people feel miserable. And same for disk, which might have even worse consequences. So we limit the disk, and we have a soft and a hard limit. The soft one is, we'll start to slow you down because you're about 80% of your capacity until you reach 100%, and then we stop you from producing uh, messages. Um, I'll skip that one. Yeah, I'll skip that one. The one's interesting for anything, Java and Kubernetes, is exit on out of memory exception to true. I think it is a very useful feature to 
not have the, the VM just stay alive, but in an inconsistent state due to out of memory error, it's better to give that information to Cube and just crash and then figure that out. All right, is Streamz useful for the other things that I've described here? Yes, there's like tons of features. Uh, so just go, uh, uh, go and dive. If you want to set up a Kube, uh, sorry, Kafka on Kubernetes, I think Streamz is a very useful uh, piece of technology. All right, uh, next is Clément that is going to discuss acknowledgement, ordering, and all the other good fun. Yeah. How do you click play on this thing? Yeah, that's so weird. You need to click here. Oh. And then here, yeah, slideshow. Yeah, thank you. So, Emmanuel said it. We are building distributed systems, and there is one true, on single source of truth in distributed systems is that it's going to fail. Whatever you do, it's going to fail. So you need to think, as soon as you start designing a distributed systems, how you are going to acknowledge, how you are going to handle orders if you need to, and how you are going to recover after something bad, like retries. So fortunately, Kafka provides a way to do that out of the box. It's very simple. You have dozens of properties to configure. Simple. So remember, a producer will, uh, will send those batch. And every time you can send those batch, you, need, you can configure a few things. First, the max.block.ms is the amount of time where you can block the initial part of the sensing. Then the linger.ms property uh, is a waiting time until we say this batch is complete. So if you have a very big linger, if you set it to a long time, then it will wait at most that time until to send that batch to the second part of the producer that will actually write it. Then we are awaiting it to be sent, which depends on the load and, and latency and things like that. And then you have the retries part, because Maybe something bad happened. Maybe the broker is not reachable. Maybe, yeah, we don't know. Something weird is happening. And so when it's right, we have uh, the request timeout.ms, which is the amount of time between the initial, we send the data to Kafka until we get the send complete and the receive complete. And if it fails, then we will retry. And we have the retry back off MS, which will delay um, the, the retries. You can configure all these uh, timeouts or have a more pragmatic way to say, OK, anyway, there are very, very fine-grained things. So I can just configure delivery.timeout.ms, which will be kind of the sum of the linger plus retry plus request timeout. So everything uh, from the bottom line. Basically, it said, OK, this is what you need to write. If you don't write it successfully before this delivery timeout MS, this is an error. And so you can react to that, get some log, and things like that. So instead of configuring all the small ones, you can just configure that one, and you're good. Axe. So when you write, you want to be sure it's written. Well, yes and no. So the producers have three acknowledgement strategies. It's not going to acknowledge until the consumer spoil it. And no, it's a broker-based acknowledgement. Like the broker got your records, and it's been written in the record. So the three strategies are zero. The, f the first one is zero. It's a string zero. Remember, map string object. Yeah, in that case, it's not zero the number. It's zero the string. Um, and basically, it doesn't wait for anything. It just say, yeah, send it. I don't care. It can fail. Don't mind, do whatever you want. Great, but totally unsecure. But it's fast. Uh, next one is one. One means that the leader of the partition you are targeting will need to hack. So you are writing to that partition leader, and this partition leader will send you back a message saying, it's written. So we're good. However, that doesn't include the replicas, the followers. So then we have all, 
which is okay, it's like one, but in addition to have been written to the leader, it wait for the acknowledgement to all the replicas. So this is clearly the most secure and reliable approach, except that it's slow. Why? Because we need to consider the latency between all your replicas. And as Emmanuel said, they are in different zones. And because they are in different zones, there is time to communicate between these zones. And so you are, if you want to be really, really fast, might not be what you want. And remember that one, because here we're thinking from the application point of view. It also has a lot of imp uh, implications on the operation side, like yep. which node do I kill and so on. So keep the acknowledgement of zero, one, and all in mind. We'll come back, that will come back a bit later. Um, when you are, well, when you are zero, you cannot retry because you don't know if that it fails. So you are completely in the dark. When you are using one and all, you can retry. And <laughs> this is the funny thing. Well, actually, Kafka retries for you a lot. Integer.max value. So that's a lot, really a lot. Fortunately, it's capped by uh, the delivery.timer.ms that I mentioned before. That's why it's uh, the property to configure. Or it will keep retraining, retraining, retraining forever. Well, forever. Integer dot max value, which is a lot. I don't have the value, in, but yeah. So again, act zero, you write, you don't know anything, fine. If it failed, it failed. Act one, you write to the leader, and it uh, replies, say, okay, it's written, but you don't know if it has been replicated into the other broker. So if there is a disaster happening at that time, and broker one dies, well, and you recover from broker two, you may be missing that record. So be aware of that. All most reliable, it waits until all the replicas said, fine, everything is okay, you can, you can send it back to, to the producer. So let's do a quick demo of this. Okay, so yeah, producer management. Um, so I will start with very same call, except that I configure the act config to be zero. Again, it's a string zero, and here I'm not in the right one. Yes. What's funny when you do this is the result is still a future. So Sun will still return a future, except that it doesn't contain any data, any metadata, because, well, it cut the, the cycle just be before that. So it will return an offset minus one. Partitions will be set, because the partitioners have selected the partitions for that record, but the offsets, we don't know, minus one. So now, if I go back and I say one, then we should get the offset, six, seven, eight, and nine. So that's good. That's exactly what we want. And all will be exactly the same. Well, except the offset will continue to increase. Uh, well, one, two, three, four, or maybe it restarted the broker in between. Um, okay, let's continue with ordering and retries. So, the, the, the first thing is the partition structures of Kafka give you ordering guarantees in the sense that inside a single partition, records are ordered in the sense that one will be before the next one, and so on, and so on, and so on. That's the offset mechanism. If ordering is important for you, make sure you always target the right partitions, and so you can rebuild it. However, this ordering guarantees uh, can be messed up when you do retries, and we will see why. So, remember, it's retries integer.max value, and you can configure that with the delivery timer.ms. The thing is that it retries that uh, uh, red circle you have here. That's what is retried. It doesn't retry the rest. Because the rest is synchronous. So if there is any failures in the serializers or partitioners or something like that, you get a synchronous exception, a runtime exception, something like this. So you do the retry on your side. 
But that second part of the retry is something asynchronous, so uh, um, Kafka handles that for you. But, as I said, topics are ordered. Well, partitions are ordered. Um, so if I get a batch partition, a topic partition for one partition, partition zero, let's say, it's full. It starts to be written. It's a bit slow. Something bad is happening. It's distributed systems. But at the same time, your producer continue filling another batch, uh, topi a batch of topic partitions for the same partitions. Again, zero. The first write fails. The second one is triggered and succeed. Because the first one failed, it gets retried after the success of the other one. You just messed up your order. The second batch has been written before the first one. Thank you, retry. Who is using ordering in Kafka? Who is con not configuring the retries in that case? Your ordering is wrong. Might be wrong. Well, it's a distributive system. It will be wrong. Let, let me put some optimistic view on that one. <laughs> <laughs> this is killing the mood here. So um, you need to think about the, the business case you have. But what I've experienced is that very often it's not so much the ordering of the producing that's important. It's that once it's there, it has to be read in, a, in an ordered fashion to be processed systematically the same by the consuming systems. And that part is not affected by yeah. this. It's, it's more the case when you, have, um, um, when you do um, event sourcing. And for each yes. record, you are saying, like, this problem can say that the record has been deleted before it gets created. So inside your partitions, you will get the delete event and then the create event, which when you will replay, you say, hey, how can it be deleted? Oh, yeah, it's created there. But you will have to reorder on the client side, which is complicated. Um, ordering is per partition, not topic. Um, so there is a few things you can do. First, you can limit the concurrency uh, with a max in-flight request per connection, which is by default is five. And basically, you reduce the number of batch partitions that can be written at a single time. So instead of having two, if you set to one, then even if one fails, then the other one won't be written until the first one succe uh, succeed after the retries. If ordering is important and reliability is important, so basically you want to build a system that works, uh, well, you will have to deal with that. So either set the uh, concurrency level to one. You can also enable it importance to two, which is now the default since Kafka 3.0.1. Uh, be careful, it importance to, to equals to two is not magic. There are still things you need to do on your side, typically deduplication, something like that. Um, Okay, so yep. the next step is to find the slide deck. There you go. Next, yep. <laughs> And the next step after that is to say, okay, so we've set up Kafka, and we know we need to deal with the upgrades. Let's think about that. So uh, you can go the like, naive, brutal way. Well, just like my database in the old days, I shut everything down, change the binary, restart everything. It probably works. <laughs> I've personally never tried. Um, the difficulty here is that because it's a distributed system, when you shut down one node, things happen because the other nodes are trying to compensate. So some sort of rebalancing uh, is happening, right? So there is some impact into doing things. Well, uh, unless you unplug the whole, you know, power socket and everything goes down at the same time, but don't do that either, right? Anyway, so, and even if you were doing that, like the, the shutdown aspect, of course, you're losing availability while you're doing that. So luckily, Kafka has the way to deal with it if you're careful. So what are the important concepts to think about? Remember the metadata store? So it's Zookeeper if you're you know, pre-craft model. So you need to upgrade that. There is a version here. There is the Kafka version, the Kafka broker version. OK. And then it's not enough because there is there are two more things that are useful. There is the the, w the language the various brokers communicate with, and they have this is this stuff is versioned as well. Like a new Kafka broker version can 
speak the older language, but an, of course an old Kafka broker might not speak the new language if there has been some change. So that's one aspect, how do they communicate with one another? And the second one is, how do they exchange the message? What, like, what's the structure of the message that is being exchanged uh, in that protocol? And how is it stored in the, in the, in the log in, the, in Kafka? Okay. Um, because an old Kafka might not understand the new one, you need to really do orchestrate a little bit the, var the various version upgrades. Uh, so first of all, Kafka lets you have one node go down while still operating because it's a distributed system and it's called the replication factor. We'll come to that later in the conversation today. So the upgrade strategy is to, well, start with the metadata, for example. So upgrade one zookeeper at a time, you know, and wait for it to be back, and then, and, and then shut down the second one and the third one and however many you have. Then fix the log format and the broker communication format to the current version that you have, let's say 2.7. And then start upgrading the, the brokers one at a time, wait for it to be back. So you, you have a mix in between like 2.7 and 2.8, but that's okay, they all talk the 2.7 language. And once you're done with, with upgrading everybody and you feel happy that it's, you will not have to downgrade, then you can move to the new protocol version to communicate. And when you're really happy, then you move to the log version because that's a non-reversible you know, sort of operation here. Make sense? So that's a lot of work. Uh, that's what an operator might be better to do, like a non-human operator. So that's what StreamZ is doing, literally. So StreamZ can handle the older version and the newer version of Kafka, sometimes more than one minor version or ma major version at a time, sometimes more, so you, you, know, you can see that. So the first step would be to upgrade StreamZ, which is the operator, but your Kafka doesn't change. You already said Kafka is 2.7 for the cluster. And then you'll start to say, well, I'll operator update Kafka to version 2.8. And then the operator will actually do the zookeeper upgrade one at a time, the Kafka upgrade broker one at a time, waiting for things to go back. I'm, I'm staying vague here because we've got special slides explaining that. And once you're happy, then you will unfreeze the broker ver protocol version, bump it up, and once you're happy, and that's the non-reversible change, then you also upgrade the log message format. By the way, log message format and broker protocol are just one thing in Kafka 3+, plus, just, just to be aware. You also need to think about the client side. Client side is also talking, it's a different language, but it's a language between the client and the broker. So how do you do the upgrade? The safe way would be to say, well, let's upgrade all of the consumers first because then they know how to speak the old language and they know the new language because they are the newer guys in town. Except it's not super easy in a system that starts to use Kafka heavily because some consumers are also producers because you pass something, transfer something and push it back to Kafka. And sometimes you're not in control of the teams, right? Some teams will have an upgrade uh, cycle that is, you know, not fully in control uh, by you, right? So you got work around, and if you do the producer first, what's happening is the producer will start speaking the new language, but the broker is uh, smart enough to then convert. If he knows that the consumer is uh, speaking the old language, will do some sort of back conversion to the old language. It does require more CPU, so be careful. You might unbalance your brokers uh, when you do that. So, uh, well, do it. Uh, calmly, and we'll mention that. So you can do that per topic, so you can really say, let's focus on this one topic and then the next one and so on, which will not put all of the load immediately at the same time. So a model I, I tend to like is you fix the version of the message, <coughs> so it doesn't change. Then you upgrade the consumers and producer at your leisure. You check that all of the applications are fine. You're paying the cost of the extra CPU in this case. And then you upgrade the message format, and then uh, that's your, you know, your move forward, right? And you can do that per topic to limit the load on the, on the system. Okay, so that's upgrading Kafka itself, but when you upgrade a system, uh, there is upgrading the system and upgrading what's happening when the stuff below the system is actually changed, right? So 
Let's start with the generic infrastructure, and then we'll zoom into how it's happening in Kubernetes. But uh, it really applies to any kind of infrastructure, whether you use a bare metal or a VM or some super magical stuff on non-cloud. So big news today. So Kafka is stateful, and that has some implications, right? It is useful because that's how Kafka guarantees that you will stay up and that you will not lose data. So it, it, unlike a database, a single node database that really focuses on the file system to give durability, Kafka does it by duplicating the data in more than one node and with the ACK all, for example, and say, okay, well, it's in N nodes across different zones, so I consider it safe, right? The storage is a secondary order in that case. So replication factor is how many copies of the normal state should I have? And by copies, it's really the copy of the partitions. Uh, three is a good first level of value. So it's, uh, it gives you enough. You can go to more, but three is the is an interesting value. And then the mean in sync replica means, OK, among those copies, how many of the brokers, how many of the partitions are really up to date compared to the leader? And how many are lagging a bit behind? So the mean in sync replica is how many of the partitions really have to be in sync uh, for me to accept read and write. Right? So the classical value is replicator factor minus one because what it allows you is to lose one availability zone entirely and still run and allow read and write in a normal fashion. The other stuff it allows you is to say, well, during my upgrade, I can get a node down and still behaving from the client's point of view, just like everything was fine. Almost, there's a small caveat, the, the client is topology aware, so it, they know about each broker, so they'll see some rebalancing going on, but they can behave, they can push messages and receive messages. Okay, so Kafka is stateful, right? Uh, so replication might take time, you know, uh, Einstein and all, relativity. Um, so <laughs> you're the only one laughing at my joke, you know. <laughs> um, so that's, that's not a good news for your joke. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say we got three, a uh, replication factor of three, right? And a mean in sync replica of two. That's, that's the situation we're in today. Like the partition one and two are in sync. The third one is a replica, but it's a bit late, right? And let's say I decide to upgrade my thing, and I don't know, I do, do it blindly. Let's kill node number one. Why not, right? Well, all of a sudden, you, you, you haven't lost data because P2 is still there, but your, your mean in sync replica is to, is to the value one and not two. So you're in a degraded mode where you can still read, but Kafka will not allow you to write and commit the offsets. So it's degraded. Maybe it's okay for your system, maybe it's not so okay for your system. And let's say, well, the node is, is gone and then an operator, a human, or your VM is you know, being respin and start the new Kafka. It's cool, maybe you have copied the old state that was there, you changed the, you moved the hard drive to the, to the new one, virtually or physically. You still have to catch up because things might have happened. Uh, so the, the system has to go and catch up on the state, or at least verify that it is catching up on the state. So you're still out of luck about the read-write aspect. And finally, you have it, right? So be careful which node you kill to do your upgrade. So let me focus on Kubernetes because it's, an infra it's a virtual infrastructure that allows you to deal with upgrading nodes and killing them. So of course, if the node physically goes down, then you know, that's the unexpected situation. But you've got a mod where you know you want to remove that node to do some upgrades, not behaving correctly, whatever. It's called a node drain. So it's draining out the workload from the node. And it really is based on the liveness and readiness probe that Kubernetes uses and a lot of distributed system uses. So liveness is, you know, my process works. Readiness is I'm ready to receive requests, right? And, and response accordingly. And it's based on, let's say you have a system and you can run, it runs real fine with 10 pods, so 10 different, well, 10 instances. And it, it still works with eight. So if you do your upgrades or whatever, you can kill up to two nodes, two pods at a time, two processes at a time, 
Okay, fine. And then the Kubernetes plays with that. He will see, okay, I've got 10, so I can kill two. If you choose this one and this one on the node he wants to move away from, kills them, wait for them to be back up and the liveness and readiness prof to say, I'm ready, I'm ready to rock, right? So, and then the, the requests are coming back into these new nodes. And then you can move to the next two ones. So it's really great for a stateless system, not so great for Kafka. Because what does that mean for Kafka to a Kafka broker to be up? Process is up. I'm allowing to receive requests. That's, that's one definition. But you might not still be in sync with the rest of the cluster. So syncing with the cluster, like communicating with the cluster, is another definition of ready. The third one is I'm actually in sync with all of the partition I'm the owner of. That's the third level. Unfortunately, those two are really dependent not so much on the one process, but on the actual cluster itself. So it's a distributed resolution that tends to be slow. So you cannot really rely on that uh, for it. So the readiness probe implementation in, uh, in Kafka, in, in StreamZ, is really like, I, I, can, I can answer requests, but I might not be in sync with the system. OK, so how do you do it safe way? So make sure you got a replication factor of three, at least, and then your mean in sync replica to minus one. So you can lose one node and still behave and read write fine. And essentially, what you do is when you drain a node, when you remove it, you will remove one zookeeper, restart one, wait for it to be ready and in sync, and then move to the next one, and then move to the next one. And same for Kafka. So move to the next one and wait for it to be ready is really the thing you need to think about and be uh, working fine. So if, you know, in, in case you use streams, this, it's been implemented. And there is a feature called the drain cleaner, which is listening to Kubernetes saying, hey, I want to kill this spot because I'm moving this node out of the, the pool. And it says, well, OK, I'll, I'll deal with it because you, you don't know Kafka. You'll just make a mess out of it, right? So you put the disruption budget to zero. You're saying, Kubernetes, you're not allowed to kill any of my pods. I'll, I'll do it. Yeah, of course, Kubernetes has a timeout. So it's like, fine, but you've got n minutes or n seconds or whatever. So you listen to those, and you mark the pod for running upgrade. And then the operator is looking at it and know about the state of Kafka and know which one it can be killed. right? So it's really a dance between Kubernetes, the operator and that drain cleaner thing. So let's see it vi visually because it's a bit uh, complicated. Same example, we got a uh, three replication partition and one of them is not in sync. And we got this drain cleaner, which is like a process running somewhere on the, on the Kubernetes cluster. There is a request to evict the P1 pod, right? Okay. Uh, the drain cleaner will say, oh, I'll deal with it. Don't, don't mention it. Um, the drain cleaner will do a soft erase, which is literally putting an annotation on that pod saying, hey, please do the rolling upgrade operator. The operator is like, OK, I see there is a label, do the rolling upgrade. And I look at the state, and I see that P3 is not in sync, which means if I kill P1, I'll be under my mean in sync replica, which is not OK. I'll wait for P3 to be up and I caught up. When it's caught up, I can actually do the kill. And then Kubernetes, the scheduler, will say, OK, well, I'm missing one of the pods here. Uh, let me find a suitable node, which is not the one I've, I'm draining, but another one, and let me redeploy that pod. That pod will catch up, and then it will be uh, ready. And then you can physically remove the node. So that's how you do it. Whether you do it manually or via the StreamZ operator, that's the clean process to do it. And I think we've got, let's say, time for one or maybe two, two questions. Is there something popping that you're in your mind that you want to get the answer to? Yes. So how do you guarantee that the replica stays in sync while there are still producer writings? Uh, I am blanking on the answer, so I don't know. I'll, I'll need to look it up. Uh, email me and I'll ask the writer guys, but here I'd rather say I don't know because uh, that's, that's a good question. 
Maybe a better question with an answer I have. <laughs> I think I had, okay. All right, let's move on then. It's me? No, it's me. Okay. All right, so we discussed the producer side. We saw a little bit how we can uh, create your Kafka under it on Kubernetes so you can upgrade your Kafka and so on. But we are missing half of the story here. How do you consume from Kafka? Because, yeah, writing is fine, but at some point, you're not writing for the beauty of writing. You're writing because you want to read this. And at Red Hat, we, we have the chance to have a group of people which are contributor to the Apache Kafka project. And uh, I have discussion with them uh, pretty regularly. And one day, one of them told me, well, the producer complexity is that. The consumer complexity is that. So consuming is actually a lot more complicating than producing to Kafka. So let's see this. The consumers is polling. It's not a push model. It's not Kafka sending you the record. It's a consumer that polls the records. So we will have a polling loop while true Paul, get some records, do something with them. It doesn't poll records one by one. That's not efficient. It polls batch of records. This batch, by default, are 500 records, which is configurable, of course, but yeah, it's kind of nice. A consumer, an instance of consumers, belongs to a consumer group. A consumer group is a group of consumers with a name. Okay. What's important to understand is that records from a specific partition are polled only once per consumer group. That means that if you have three consumers inside your consumer group, the records from a single partition will be polled only by one of them. Okay? If everything is, uh, is working and so on. We will talk about failures later. Now, if you have a topic with three partitions and a consumer group with three consumers, everything is fine. Each consumer gets um, assigned to a single partition. So basically, you have this assignment thing. Like, here is my group, I have X consumers, here is my set of partitions, and I'm doing the assignment and so on. Periodically, a consumer should say to the broker, hey, by the way, I'm done with these records, so even if I crash, we start from the next one. That's what we call a commit. We are not committing uh, records per se, we are committing an offset. So a topic partition offset. We are going to say to the broker, on these partitions, I'm done with all the records before that offset. So if I said I'm committing three, that means that the record zero, one, and two have been processed successfully. Okay? Remember that because that is going to be very interesting. Committing is very important because if I crash and I restart and I configure my Kafka and consumer uh, uh, correctly, I will restart from the last committed position, which means that I won't restart from the beginning of age, but from the last committed position. That means that I can have duplicates, we will see that, but not a lot. So, the art of consuming from Kafka. So imagine these two partitions, three consumers, two from the same group, A, and one on the on a single group, B. So the consumer three is alone. So the assignment will say, okay, my group A, two partitions, two consumer, perfect match, one, one. Everything is fine. Um, if I restart, it might switch by the, uh, but yeah. Group B, single consumer, two partitions. Okay, you get the two partitions just for you. You are going to consume all the records just for you. So imagine now that uh, partitions get unbalanced and things like that. You need to be careful that because of this, what we said at the beginning with balanced partitions. You may overflow one consumer 
uh, because it gets the partition with most data, while at the same time we have another partition with less data and the consumer will just wait for more data. So be very careful uh, with the assignments and be sure that your partitions are correctly balanced in the sense that you don't have too much differences. It's never possible to be exactly at the same uh, size, but yeah. Um, because that, that's really, really tricky to fix. Um, periodically, we need to commit. Commit is basically a write. We are writing to a specific uh, compacted topic, which is named underscore underscore consumers underscore offsets. This is for um, upstream Kafka, uh, Apache Kafka, the, the real one. Um, you have implementation of the Kafka protocol, such as Red Panda, which use a different approach to store the commits. But this is what we have in regular Kafka. So we need to poll. Basically, we are going to subscribe to a set of topics and write a polling loop, while to poll with some duration, which means that even if it doesn't get 500 records, it will still release after one second, and then you process your records. See, it's a plural, records. That's your batch. Inside, you can have records from one partition or two partition or three partition, depending on the assignment, but you get that. And you process them. Relatively simple. Well, okay, while true is not great, but let's imagine that then you do a system exit and everything is fine. However, this is what's happening behind the poll method. It's a lot more complex than just polling. So, you subscribe, you poll, the first thing you will do is get a cluster topology. Basically, it retrieves the metadata for the cluster to understand who is owning what. For this, it's going to interact with the first Kafka broker, which is a bootstrap server, the one you configured, the entry point of your Kafka system. Then, your consumers belong to a group. You cannot pull without belonging to a group. So you belong to a group, so you need to find the group coordinator. To find the group coordinator, you are going to ask a random node of your cluster, might not be the bootstrap server, any nodes will have this info and say, hey, can you tell me who is responsible for my group again? So you will get that data and then you will need to connect with the coordinator. This is only three round trips with potentially three different machines in three different zones. So then you interact with your coordinator. Your coordinator has been elected to be the coordinator of that specific consumer group. So if you have a lot of consumer group, you will need a coordinator for each consumer group. One cluster can obviously handle multiple consumer groups. And so you connect to the coordinator, and the coordinator, uh, so there is some exchange and some chit chat between your consumers and the coordinator, but basically the first thing you will do is just start a habit. So basically, you will tell to the coordinator, yeah, I'm, part, I'm a consumer, part of your group, uh, but if I don't give you news from me in two minutes, that's because I'm dead. So that means that the coordinator is the one responsible for keeping track of who is still there in the group. That's why it's a coordinator. Obviously, distributed system, the coordinator can also crash. And then you have the whole story from Emmanuel, which is a lot more complicated than what he presented because you have all the um, rest restructuring all the consumer groups, finding the new coordinators and things like that. So, once you are starting the herd bit, you join the group officially with a group protocol. You have something called rebalance, we will cover that later. Then you get your assignment, meaning from which partition I'm allowed to pull records. Because at that moment, I don't know yet. The coordinator will say, oh yeah, you, as consumer, you have partition zero and one. That's it. Um, you get your assignment, then you will reset your position in these partitions from the last committed one. And finally, you will start polling the records, so fetch the records uh, and, and deserialize and so on. And for this, you will interact with the leader uh, actually, no, with any replicas uh, in sync of your, of your partitions. So that's a lot of round trips with lots of different machines to finally pull some records. So consumer.poll is hard, very, very complicated. So 
the, another thing is that because it's so complicated, concurrency is very, very something you need to, to think about. So to simplify the whole thing, unlike the producers, consumers must always be performed on a single thread, on the polling thread. The thread that do poll is a thread you will use for every interaction with the consumer. Everything. That's a little bit weird, a single threading system. Pulse block. So for you have a timeout, so you say, okay, for one second, I'm waiting. Um, every operation you want to do well, will be between pole. So basically what you will need to do, and you start seeing that, is that, okay, so I have this thread that is going to pull. I need to enqueue all the operations that I want to do, and after the polls, it will execute them and things like that. So you need a queue of operations and things like that. It starts to be a lot more complicated than a while true and so on. You must call poll frequently. If you don't, well, your coordinator will believe that you're dead. Because he believes that you're dead, he will remove the assignment from your partitions, saying, hey, you didn't say hi anymore for the last two minutes, and you're not there anymore. So your partitions get reassigned to someone else. Which means that the next time you will try to pour from these partitions, will be rejected because they don't belong to you anymore. They belong to another, of another consumer of the same group. And things start to be very, very messy in that case. So you need to call Paul very periodically. Um, so that's the thing. I get a batch of records, 500. Let's take that. And processing these records, well, take a bit of time because I'm building a distributed system and I need to write these records to a database. And writing to the database is not super fast. Uh, and let's say that processing and writing take one second per record. Maybe half a sec on your machines, but in well, it's one second. So to process the full batch, you need 500 seconds, which is more than the heartbeat protocol. So if you do this, the broker will consider you dead. So you should be very, very careful with blocking that thread. OK, fine. I remember all my computer science class, and I was going to dispatch that to some other thread so I don't block, and so on. Yeah, let's see that. Remember, you need to pull, uh, to, to commit periodically to, to say where you are, where you are in, the, in the partitions. Um, by default, Kafka consumers is doing auto commit. So basically, you don't do anything, and periodically, every five seconds, once you call poll, at the end of poll, yeah, uh, I know actually, yes, at the end of poll, it's going to commit the uh, latest positions that you retrieve, so from the previous one. Regardless if you consume them or process them successfully or not. Because you didn't want to block, you offload that to another thread, so you don't track success anymore, it's going to just commit. And here, if something bad happened, well, Kafka will consider that everything is fine. Actually, it was not. So you need to process the record synchronously. Because if you don't, then you will be in trouble. So <laughs> there is a problem. I need to not block, but I need to process things synchronously. Yeah, that's a little bit Kafka-esque, as we say in French. It's not like, it's what? Well, that's exactly what we need. Um, so the thing is, uh, what happens is that during the poll, we have some auto commits happening, as I said, which is asynchronous, which, yeah, periodically. But auto commit is probably one of the settings that I would recommend you to disable as soon as possible, because, yeah, it doesn't do what you believe needs to do. Um, and these two rules are kind of contradictory to each other. So what can we do? Well, we can say, let's do asynchronous and non-blocking, which is fine. You cannot use auto-commit, because if you use auto-commit, you will lose records, because it will commit things that you believe that has been processed successfully while it's not there. It will do uh, at most once delivery. Yeah, OK. Um, 
Or you can do the commit yourself, so you disable auto commits, and then you are responsible for committing the offset yourself. And then you say, yeah, but that's fine. I will take my records, process one, commit, process one, commit, process one, commit. Yeah, except that this is a lot of writes for a broker that is not expecting so much writes. So basically, if you do that, you are going to be very, very, very slow. So you need to accumulate a set of processed records and then commit. Except that you commit a position, meaning that everything before that position will be considered done. So you need to be very careful when you do this that, well, you don't have uh, one of your records that is still waiting to be processed or something slow or poison pill or something like that. Okay, so not a lot of words. Let's have a look at how it's looking in the real world. Okay, so. So this is my uh, very simple application. It's just pulling. I'm going to write some records. Okay, fine. I configure it so that doesn't change. So this time we need deserializer and not serializer. I need to read from Kafka. Okay, uh, that's the name of my uh, uh, consumer group, and um, I'm going to keep auto commit enabled, and that's it. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that was not. So, I have a to commit enabled. Everything will be fine in that case because I don't do anything fancy. So, if I go back to my UI here, and I have this integer here, um, and you see I have my consumer group A, fine, and the offset has been committed. So, periodically it will commit it. So, that's, that's good. Okay. Um, and what you see is that it has retrieved, I've wrote 1,000 records to a single partition, it retrieves a first batch, second batch, and then nothing. But if you don't call Paul, because there is nothing, it will be considered dead, and so when there will be something, you won't get it. If I disable auto commit with this, go back here, well, I don't do anything, so basically nothing will ever happen. I will still retrieve the things, but my offset will never be committed. So basically if I go back here, it will say, hey, you don't have lag, meaning that you have pulled the most recent records, that's good, but at the same time, if you crash and restart, you will restart from the beginning. Now, to avoid this, we need to commit. And for example, I'm going to do that here. Consumer record, okay. Consumer, oops, consumer dot commit. So you have two versions, commit sync, commit async. Commit sync will commit all the latest positions, so generally a little bit dangerous, or you pass a map of topic partition and offset and metadata, which basically for each topic partitions, you will tell where you want. And if you do that, don't do that because that will commit after every process, so that's what we don't want to do for performance reason. but that will work in the sense that now, if I go back here, I got my last offset committed. All right, so keep that in mind because we will go back to that. Uh, is that me or you after? That's me. Oh, okay, <coughs> good. So by the way, I've got the answer to the question you asked. So <coughs> if there is a lot of producer pushing stuff, uh, how come mean in sync replica is ever happening? Because the leader receives something and then there's always new stuff coming into the leader and the, the replicas are never in sync. Well, what happens is that if you use act zero, then you're just uh, like you're <laughs> riding without a helmet and all of that, right? So let's forget about this case. If you do act all, what's happening is the leader is uh, receiving your request, but is not acting until it has 
receive the act from at least mean in sync replica. So there is a natural back pressure to the producers uh, in that system. It won't be act until it's you know fully done at least for mean in sync replica. So that's how it happens. If you do act one. Fundamentally, you do accept that your data might not be in sync, and therefore uh, you might lose data. I don't know the detail whether there is back pressure in Kafka, but conceptually, that's that's how it works. Okay, so what is a working Kafka? Well, that's an interesting topic. So, to me, it's a philosophical question, and this is my answer. These are clients that can produce and consume records to and from the Kafka. The rest is a black box. What I want is push stuff in, get stuff out, ideally the same. So from there, we need to essentially find uh, how we measure that thing. And you could say, well, I'll check the apps and make sure that whatever they put in, they get out. Uh, except you might not be in control of the app, there might be five, six, ten different teams working on the, the same topic for some reason. Uh, even if you were, the app uh, might not push the right metrics, or the garbage collector might mean that the application is not behaving correctly, not Kafka itself, but the application. Or it could be that there is a network problem that could be close to the app, close to the Kafka, maybe a different team, or maybe a third team that is doing the pipe in between. Right? So it's not easy to say, here is my definition, and here is the proxy I will use to express that. Right? A little bit of a sidebar on, on, sidebar on service level objective. So first of all, the service level, th there are three sisters. Service level agreement, which is the legalist thing saying, oh, we'll get you some money, you will not sue us, those sort of legalist stuff. It's not super interesting for developers and ops. There is service level indicator, which is really how you measure to know whether you've reached your objective or not. So it's just like, if you don't have an indicator, you, don't have an ob you cannot really have an objective that's measurable. The objective is really the contract by the team saying, this is where we want to be. We want to have a latency or an uptime or whatever, a throughput of this 90% of the time or 95% of the time, okay? It's good because it's a contract. If the team believes it's a bit below, then they need to catch up. They're going to work just on improving the stability or the speed of the system, no new feature. If they are above, then that's their budget to go and experiment and do crazy stuff. Uh, so it's really a balance of innovation versus stability. Uh, try not to put too many service level objectives, like start with, I don't know, three, four, five max. Uh, it's already a lot to try and control and measure. Try to have it as close as possible to the user experience, which I believe my definition for Kafka is a good one. So how do you do like you don't control the app, but you still want to have a proxy for the an application reading and writing from Kafka? So we've re remember the Canary stuff I mentioned around the, the quota? This is it. So Canary is really, it's an app. It's running. It's going through the external network to make sure the configuration, on, in our case, of Kubernetes is doing properly the network stuff. And it produces a message, or end messages, and then reads those end messages and measures, and puts that information into our metric system. All right, that's all it does. Push message, get message from each of the brokers. So there is at least n par one partition per broker, so we touch every single broker. right? And it really is a good, good proxy for it. It doesn't solve everything, but it's a good proxy to get started on your, on your metrics. So how many messages are produced? How many are consumed? Do we have errors? Uh, what's the latency? What's the connection latency? All of that is data that is pushed up to the metric system. And you can use it. I don't believe you even need to use the StreamZ operator, because it's a very simple app that just push and read stuff and push stuff to metrics. They, we have also, you know, pushed on Grafana the, you know, the portal thing, uh, like the uh, a dashboard that you could use to measure those metrics and, and keep them around. And that will back to Clément. Speed up a tiny bit. All right. So I forget to open that one. So remember what I just said about uh, offsets. So how do I commit? When do I commit? How do I handle that? 
So basically, this is a partition. Fine. We have a few things you, we need to understand here. First, well, the offset, zero to a lot, okay. Um, the first thing is that between the beginning and what we call the high watermark, it's what we call the, well, the replicated section. So that means that section of the partition has been replicated to the other replicas. So we are fine. If everything crashes, we will restart from this, from this high watermark. We have the log and offset, which also in Kafka, you always off by one at the beginning, but the uh, LEO, log and offset, is actually the next record that will be written. So basically, it's the next available offset. So last written plus one. Then for a consumer or for a consumer group, you have the 0 and 1, which has been processed successfully, which means, okay, we process them and we committed. We committed the offset. So we always commit the last, the last offset that has been processed successfully plus 1, which is why the last committed offset is 2. From 2 to 5, it has been pulled. Maybe in the same batch as the 0 to 5, we don't know. But it has been pulled, so that means that the poll method has retrieved all of these. And they are in process of being processed. 6 is the current position. That means that 6 is where the next poll will start. If you call poll after, even if you didn't process anything between 2 and 5, if you call poll again, you will go from 6 to the size of the batch. So commit sync and commit async. So there is three ways of committing offset. Auto commit, as I said, don't do that. Explicit commit sync or explicit commit async. Commit sync and commit async must be called from the Kafka polar thread, which are these kind of operations that need to be enqueued or done periodically and so on. Uh, the API is, as I said, you can just use without any parameters and that will commit the last position for all your topic partitions, which is not what you want most of the time. Or you just do, or you build a map of topic partition, offset and metadata, which uh, contains for each topic, uh, topic partitions where you want to commit. Again, remember, plus one. This plus one really got a lot of headaches or a lot of body. Uh, so, in Upstream Kafka, in Apache Kafka, when you commit, it's actually writing a record to a compacted topics, which is underscore underscore consumer underscore offsets, uh, which will be replicated and so on. So it's a write, because it's a write, it follows everything we said about the write, retries and so on. So be very careful and be, well, you need to understand that. So it's a compacted topics, which is a subject we're not going to, to mention here, but basically it's a, it clean up all data periodically. If you looked inside this topic, which is interesting, you will see this. Uh, yeah, because it's a compacted to to uh, topic, but it's a specially serialized thing. So basically, you can read it like the first tuple is consumer group, topic, partitions, then the offset metadata, which you have the offset here with no metadata attached, and so on, and, and you have this. So it's not very interesting, but in case you really want to look into that topic, you can. But again, this is Apache Kafka specific. Other implementation may use the different mechanism. As I say, do not commit after each record because each commit is a write. A write can be slow and so on. So you need to accumulate and write. The initial position is another thing in the Kafka consumer that is a little bit weird. Uh, like enabling auto commit. So the initial position is okay. If I'm a new consumer on a new consumer group, and I'm subscribing to some topic, and no one before me from that consumer group have done anything, there is two way. First, there is uh, the Kafka default. It will only pull the records that come after my arrival. But if I already wrote records to that topic before that, to that topic partitions before that, they won't be processed. 
That's the default, which means that the first commit you will do, you will erase everything before. Well, erase. You will consider that it has been processed while it's not. So be very, very careful. This is the default strategy, what they call latest, and I recommend to use earliest every time, which means that even if stuff has been written before your arrival, you will restart from that beginning of time instead of just everything after that. Because, yeah, at least if you commit, yeah, you will commit to things you have really uh, processed and not things that you ignore. So configure that with auto.offset.reset uh, equals earliest, which I recommend, or latest, which is a default. And the reason is the initial position with latest is a uh, uh, LEO. This commit management from Kafka um, is sometimes not flexible enough. And sometimes you want to uh, do what we call um, uh, checkpointing, which basically means, OK, I want to deal with all this complexity myself um, and store my commits somewhere else. Because a commit doesn't contain a lot of things. It can contain just a position, basically, some metadata, but nothing else. But sometimes you want to attach some state with that, some processing state, like it's where I am, and that's my current state, or something like that. So for this, you will offload the commit position to um, another system, can be an infinity, um, uh, in-memory database, like InfiniSpan, or it can be Redis, can be a database, can be whatever you want. And basically, when you do this, you're switching a little bit the model where, on start, you are going to retrieve from your data store, containing that data, where you are, you will restore the state and the position, and then you will seek to that position and start pulling from that position, and so on. And periodically, instead of committing with Kafka, you are going to update the position in the database. Um, so, right to messaging, is, which is the next topic, we'll uh, propose an API to do that, so you don't have to do it completely yourself. Um, uh, it has a, a commit handler which lets you uh, uh, simplify this if you really need more flexibility. It's, it's experimental. Okay, so now I'm going to explain why most of the things I I explained so far is completely useless. <laughs> so, in Quarkus, we wanted to also um, understand, well, try to propose a way to build event driven architectures and event driven microservices, which are applications interacting with messages coming from Kafka, RabbitMQ, MQP, whatever you want, GMS, and so on. So, because uh, Quarkus is based on a CDI kind of, uh, of model, of injection model, we have what we call message uh, event-driven uh, microservices and event-driven bin, uh, which are bins that would receive messages or events, process them, and send other events, and so on and so on. We have two specific dark circles there, which what we call connectors. So basically, how it works. I have a broker, Kafka, for example, the first connector, the inbound connector, is going to do the polling for me. It will do everything I just said, doing right, keeping track of the commits, doing all the commits, and so on. And then it will write the messages into channels, which are in-memory buffer, if you want. These are not buffer, but yeah. And my bins will process them, will write to another channel, for example, and so on. And then it will write, eventually, to an outbound connector which will do the producer side, so write to Kafka correctly, with everything I just said. So how it works in terms of development model? Well, two new annotations, at incoming, at ongoing, as they both indicate the channels you want to read and write. Um, if the channels is managed by a connector, that might be the, your uh, uh, topic names, for example. And that's it, so orders can be my topic, shipping can be my topic, and boom, it will do the rest. Um, it will handle acknowledgement for you. So meaning that when I receive something, I will keep track of where I am, who's a commit, uh, offset, and so on. And I will start the processing, and so on. And when the processing completes, maybe because it's written to Kafka and I receive an hack, one or all things, that's all, that's, that's done, then I will go back to my chain of hacks and say, oh, that message has been processed successfully. 
So of course, I don't commit immediately because committing immediately for each message would be bad. I keep track of all the position and things like that and commit when I want. So this is what we call the post-processing strategy. There is other strategies like pre-processing, none, and manual. Uh, but it's what we recommend and what is mostly used. Obviously, bad things also happen in distributed systems. And at some point, you need to handle failures. That's what we call a knack or negative acknowledgement. Same thing, once I have a knack, I say, oh, this message was not processed correctly. I go back the chain and say, this one, this message didn't go well. So I decide what I want to do. Uh, I can ignore the failure, I can uh, write it to a DLQ, a uh, specific topic, which someone someday will retry, or will have a look, uh, or it's name slash dev slash null, but yeah, it's uh, generally is what happens with DLQ, but at least we continue processing. When we build microservices, we need a way to interact with HTTP because most microservices are HTTP, so we need some kind of bridge between the two worlds. That's what we do with emitters. Um, so an emitter is another specific object which is attached to a channel, and every time we do send, you just write to the channel, so I can do HTTP and so on. The opposite, uh, uh, the opposite is true with add channels, uh, but uh, with a, a string. So some Kafka features that has been integrating in reactive messaging, that was a very, very quick overview. Um, this is completely asynchronous. It implements a control flow. Kafka doesn't necessarily have a control flow. The consumer poll, you say, yes, that's my control flow. Except that because it needs to poll periodically, or it will be considered dead, it's not a very good control flow. Because how do you say to Kafka that you're full? while you still need to call poll. So there is a trick. There is a trick. You need to call pause first, and then call poll, and because you paused, you say, oh yeah, so you're still there, but you don't want anything. And when you have back in capacity of processing, then you call resume. You can't believe, because everything needs to happen from the same thread in the right order, things can get very, very messy to implement. Fortunately, this is done for you. Um, there is also a few things. We auto-detect serializer and deserializer, and if you didn't provide one, we will use JSON by default. You don't need to provide anything. You want to exchange person object, movie object, no worries. We will use JSON by default for you. Why JSON? Because by analyzing the usage of Kafka around us, among our customers and users, it's by far what is the most used today. Avro come next. Uh, we have three commit strategies. Um, throttle, that we will detail later. Latest and ignore. Ignore is a commit strategy that don't commit. But you can write your own. Be careful. When you start writing your own commit strategy, you need paracetamol, or whiskey, or both. Um, failure handling. Well, same thing. You can, we have failure handlers. Ignore. I don't care. Fail which means, okay, I'm stopping, or DLQ. Or you can write your own. Less paracetamol required for this. It's much, much easier. We provide metrics, tracing, cloud events, and a lot of more features. So basically, everything I said has been integrated into this uh, middleware and doing the right thing at the right time. So the commit strategy. So ignore, yeah, fine. We don't commit. Latest, bad. We commit periodically the latest of sets, regardless if everything before that has been processed or not. Um, throttled. This is the default, and this is what you need to use. Remember this? That's exactly what it is doing. It is tracking everything you received and check when it has been processed. And periodically, check the latest of sets where everything before that of sets has been processed. If everything before that offset has been processed successfully, it commits a position plus one, remember? So position plus one. The problem with this is that you can have a poison pill. A poison pill is a record that you can't process. It will always fail. You can retry, it will fail. So in that case, it will start, you process, you process, and boom, poison pill. The poison pill 
will kill the total commit strategy because you can't commit anymore. The maximum you can commit here is four because three has been, can be processed uh, successfully plus one, four. But you will never be able to commit five or six. Why? Because I have a hole in my uh, processing strips. So four, there is a problem with that. So what can happen? You ignore it and you will continue pulling, 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 having out of memory very quickly. You can fail, which is what we do by default. So basically, to avoid having an OOM, we mark your application on an LC as soon as we detect a poison pill. So when we detect a poison pill, we say, yes, sorry, but something bad happened, something we can't handle. You will have to have a look at, at that. We, we say the, which topics, uh, which uh, offsets. Um, you can write your custom commit strategy, as I said, whiskey and uh, paracetamol required for that. Uh, so you have all those methods to, uh, to do, to implement. Very quickly, failure management. Uh, and then it's a break, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so failure management, it's a knack. Uh, if it's a poison pill, that's fine because I can write it to a DLQ and continue my process. But if I don't handle my uh, poison pill correctly, then yeah, I have the problem. We provide three strategies, fail, ignore, and DLQ. Uh, fail, we stop. Something bad happens, we just, yeah, that's the safest, but not necessarily what you want. Ignore, which will just log somewhere in the, mis in the uh, uh, pod log. So basically it's lost forever. Or DLQ, which means that I'm, we are writing to a DLQ topic, which is configurable, of course, uh, with all the metadata you need to say, oh, that's this one. Which means that I will continue be able to process the rest of my topic. I just mark that record, say, yeah, that re record, yeah, something bad happened. So you cannot use DLQ if ordering is important because at some point you will need to take these records written in the DLQ and re-inject them inside your business logic. But they will be re-injected after the rest of the processing. So ordering will be lost. So if ordering is very, very important, yeah, failed is much, much better. Uh, yeah. uh, you can write your own custom uh, failure strategy. So there is only two uh, methods to implement. First, under, the second one, terminate, uh, which is called when we terminate. What about retrying? Because sometimes you have um, errors, failures that are just may disappear automatically, like uh, system not available, or they are doing a rolling update, or something like that. Uh, in that case, you can just use a retry annotation, which is provided by Quarkus. It's transparent, right? Yeah. You're, not, you're unfair to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's transparent, they say. <laughs> but you see your latency doing whoop, but yeah. That is, yes, <laughs> that could happen. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's generally it happens completely transparently, but sometimes, yeah, we see it. Um, in that case, you can just use the at retry um, uh, annotations. It will retry. If you don't set anything, I think it's three times. You can configure back off strategy, number of retries. You can use fallbacks. You can write circuit breaker. Well, you can use the circuit breaker annotation. So we have a lot of things to do that. This will retry your processing logic. It's not the uh, write into Kafka that will be retried. This is, is what we discussed earlier. This is really your processing logic failed for one reason or another one. You can retry that. Uh, that's all I have. Now it's probably time for the break. Yes. Um, we? Yeah, how long? So I propose you come back at uh, 24. <laughs> so in 10 minutes. Uh, Very I'm precise. Conscious of your, the time you need to just uh, re-energize. So 24, be there, we'll start at that time. Uh, in the meantime, if you have questions, you can come down, the, down here and we'll uh, help you around. All right, so obviously Emmanuel should restart, but Emmanuel just run. Um, Okay, so <laughs> that's an asynchronous arrival of Emmanuel. No, no, it's just that I missed my own SLO, see? Um, um, it's relevant. Uh, Next one. Okay, so we have our, 
objectives. So my objective was to be there at 24. I failed. So how could I have prevented this? So that's what we're going to discuss about. What's interesting, though, is that the how to deal with Kafka will start talking about things that are, have nothing to do with Kafka, because you need to protect your fundamentals before going to the details of Kafka. We'll come to those, but we need to build the fundamental. So you're saying, hey, I've got a system. I want to operate it, so I'll buy this massive dashboard screen. I'll put lots of dashboard on it and put one person behind it looking at it, and it will be fine. No, it won't, right? Because the human is slow, uh, can fall asleep, need to take a break, get coffee, you know, whatever. And you can put several humans, and they talk and get a more coffees and whatnot. So it's not the right way. Uh, dashboards are, so capture the metrics, fundamental. Dashboards are really useful, but not as a preemptive thing. It's more like a reactive thing. You, s you see something goes wrong, and you can, it's like a debugging tool. You go and investigate thanks to the dashboard to drill down where things are really wrong, OK? Alerts is essentially a rule that says, based on that metrics and how it evolves, I think something is wrong. And I'll call somebody to do something about it, OK? So alerts is this level. And that's probably what you should have, because it's much faster as far as reaction time. A better alert is an alert that tells the human what to do. If you wake somebody on a Saturday evening at 2 a.m. and say, hey, panic, something's going wrong, and sorry, I don't know what to do, the person is like lost. So you really need actionable items. That's the best. Uh, and of course, you can self-feel, like you can even solve the solution by code without having to involve a human. But that depends like how often that happens, and so on and so on. But the key thing is, protect your base. The base in our case, what is it? The Kafka, the, the broker, maybe the zookeeper. We need to figure out whether that's you know, critical or if it can be degraded. And measuring our things. So pro the Prometheus stack in our case, the Canary, we'll mention that later. right? So not only you protect the actual system, but how you measure and how you see things. So I'll mention. Uh, Alerts and standard operating procedures. This is a really a small subset of what we use for uh, Kafka that we manage for our customers. Uh, I try to get the most interesting one. And because we use uh, Kubernetes, that's the infrastructure we use. So Prometheus, the usual. First local on a given Kubernetes cluster and then centralized for the fleet aggregation. Grafana for dashboard, alert manager, which is part of Kubernetes for the actual alert rules uh, based on a PromQL uh, you know, input. Uh, and what's cool about it is that you can put it in a Git repo and you know, uh, pull requests and you know, see it properly. How do you alert a human? So we happen to use PagerDuty, but uh, what's important is a system that alerts the human when it is supposed to be alerted. So you know, uh, up I mean, the zone where the person is supposed to be on duty versus not on duty is important. And we'll mention that, but how do you know that your alert system is actually working? It's an important aspect. So one thing is important is like, are you even measuring things? Because if you don't measure, you might be having a really great night but the system is down, and then you will have a really bad morning. So I don't know what is worse, the bad <laughs> night or a worse morning, morning, but you choose. So this, this is an uh, alert manager alert. So what you're saying is that I want the fleet chart operator to be up, and I want to make sure that is is actually sending some metrics, right? If it's not, if the scraping is not happening, then something is wrong, and I'm not seeing what could be wrong. And I need to be alerted. And it's a critical one. So what do you do when the metrics are down? Well, first of all, you start to look like, is the pod up? Because if it's down, then it's not pushing metrics. And you can investigate. So you gather the log. And then you look at your metric system. Is the, what's the status of Prometheus? Is the bit late? You know, is the component status working? Did you forget to match that you want this pod to be pushed to the right Prometheus? Is there a discrepancy here? Right. And generally speaking, check your other, other systems. 
What is a standard operating procedure? It is literally the stuff somebody needs to do when an alert is being raised and something has to be fixed, right? In our case, we make a really strong rule that says every alert should have one if nobody will be as uh, expert in the system as the person writing it. And since we're not putting the Kafka upstream committer on a, you know, on a front line, uh, we need to have lots of operating procedures to that whose job it is to help the person that is not as expert to make it back into a proper shape before we can investigate further at the very least, right? So it can be understood by a very foggy brain. And it follows the same sort of steps. Uh, where is it? Uh, well, I guess you won't see it. So <laughs> um, how can I zoom it to the full screen? This? Yeah, I'll do no. That. No. Sorry. So, the standard operating procedure has to have a description, the context. Hey, this alert happened because this, this, and that. So the person is writing context and under, understand what's going on. Then the list of tools that have to be used to fix the problem. If you don't have those tools, you get them first, right? And then what are the very specific steps to execute to go towards the resolution? A validation phase, let's make sure what you've done is, is fixing stuff. Don't do a fire and forget, not an act zero sort of thing. And if things go wrong, like not, is not working, then let's go for the troubleshooting aspect. Uh, we'll try to get you the example a bit later. All right, so one thing that is important is, is your alert system even working? If it's not, you have a problem. So what we use in our case is we have a, a virtual always one metric. And what we're saying is that if that metric is one, let's raise the alert. So the alert system should always raise an alert here because the virtual matrix is always in the wrong value. OK? And then you need some sort of system that tells you when the alert starts to be silent. right? So you got your matrix. The alert manager always triggers the alert. And there is a service called Deadman Snitch, but you can you know, have your own or find an alternative. And what it's saying is that as long as I receive an alert every n minutes, everything is fine. And it's XOR, box, XOR gate, essentially. Uh, but if I stop receiving the alerts, I need to raise, tell somebody, hey, you're, you're getting blind here. Maybe you should look at something. OK? So that's an important part of your system. The other one is uh, there's the core of the system. There's also how you measure your SLO. Remember the SLO, we proxied it with the canary. So how do you check that the canary is actually producing the data that is important for you? So what we're saying is here for each namespace, which, in, which means for each Kafka cluster, look at the canary and let's make sure. And we know that it actually is supposed to send metrics regularly, unlike, unlike another app, right? And if we have nothing for five minutes, then something is wrong. Unless the external connection is unavailable also for five, for five minutes in a row. So that's interesting here, because there is the core of the rule, and then there is an unless, which is suppressing the rule. And it's important, because if something goes wrong, let's at the super low level, you don't want the uh, engineer on call or the person on call to really receive like 5,000 alerts and have to filter out which one is really the core problem. So when you have higher level rules, you try to suppress it when you know that a lower level problem will raise this alert, right? So there, there is an alert that is around the network not being available, and it's going to be raised. And this one will not be raised, not to pollute the uh, headspace of the person. Um, so this one is critical, right? You got to go on it right away. There is another one which is less critical, which is, hey, the canary is sort of kind of working, but it happens to be crashing a bit more than what we expected. You don't have to look at it like right away, but maybe let's log a ticket and within two days or four days, you look at it and figure out what's going on, right? So it's a warning level alert. So what do you do when a canary is down? Because you're starting to be blind from a, your SLO point of view, which is the stuff you guarantee to your customers, right? So you go to the instance, you essentially get the log to know what's going on. 
Uh, you do the IT crowd stuff. You know, have you tried to turn it off and on again? Just do that. Uh, the Canary pod will restart, and you, then you can check the log, especially the new ones, and you might see that, hey, it cannot reach a given broker, maybe the authorization is not working, or you know, there's some network issue. So you start to having a little bit of a clue about what's going on and why it is failing, right? And then either you've managed to figure it out or you talk to engineering for keeping like a better understanding of the stack and try and think, find the solution. So that's protecting our SLO. Let's protect our core value, which is, let's say, the Kafka broker. So here we want to say, OK, if we have a thing in the next space, is the status of those pods ready? And is the StreamZ resource saying that it's ready? If it's not the case, then we have a problem. And to investigate a Kafka down, it's a uh, <coughs> Due to the state aspect of it, it's, uh, it's like a keep calm and, uh, well, keep calm. <laughs> um, so, again, get the logs, check, you know, investigate what's going on, investigate any leads. It's a very wide open-ended standard operating procedure because this is the last, the one thing that should not happen because we would have lots of other procedures to anticipate that problem, right? And very quickly, you might want to reach out to engineering, especially around any kind of data uh, impacting aspect you might do. All right, so that's the so that was the the general infrastructure. I think I'm doing these ones too. Do you? Probably. Yeah. Yeah, you are. Uh -huh. See. Back there. <laughs> <coughs> So this was the very low-level infrastructure aspect. Let's move on to one higher level. So first of all, are you Kafka even showing up? When I ask for a new Kafka to be there via a new StreamZ request or something higher level in our case, is that even happening? So if I have a resource and no Kafka, then I need to raise some alert, right? And what do I do in that case? Um, if, if I got a request, an intent, but no execution, yeah, it looks like the operator is not doing its job. So let's look at that instance. Let's get the status of that pod. Let's extract the log and see what's going on. The other stuff is that it might actually be the underlying infrastructure, like the Kubernetes. So in our case, the SRE team is dealing with the Kafka, and there is another SRE team dealing with the managed OpenShift, the managed Kubernetes. Right, so there is a difference of responsibility. So they might actually talk to the other team saying, hey, is, are you doing something funky with the nodes? Right. The other stuff that could happen is the zookeeper, the coordinator somehow is not doing things super right. So the easy way to start is like, let's reboot the operator and see what's going on. And uh, you can use the cube rollout, which is the way to just doing it softly. Like let's put a flag to put it down and back up in a nice way with no downtime. The other one is you kill the pod, and Kubernetes at some point would say, hey, hold on, somebody f messed up with reality. Let me fix it. Right. OK. So remember, we have the, our, our Kafka instance meeting the SLO, so we need to product that aspect. And meeting the SLO means I am up enough to meet that 95% or 99.95%. Okay. So how do you measure that? Uh, let's say we got an SLO of 99.95. It means there is a certain amount of time per, let's say, month or per 28 days uh, that you can not be up. And then after that, you have to be up for the rest to meet your SLO. Right? But how fast are you going to breach your SLO? So you can do some sort of math that says, if I have a burn rate of 1, it means I'm losing my uptime at a rate which means at the end of the month, I will just be at my SLO. Nothing above, nothing below, right? So one is technically fine unless you have some other problems down the road, right? So one is okay. Below one is kind of nice because you're, you're within your, your error budget and you can inv innovate a bit. If you are at more than one, then you know that you won't be able to end the month with matching your SLO, right? And the higher this value is, the worse your situation you are, right? So 2% in one hour is like a 13.7 rate. And these are like um, 
tested by uh, like a lot of that information come from the Google Assyrian book. And they're saying, well, we got three that we care about, like 2% in one hour. That's like, OK, stuff on fire. Just just get uh, go and fix it because the SLO will burn like real fast. 5% in six hours is essentially within four days, you will have lost your your budget, your error budget. So let's put a ticket and during day normal operation time, the management team will go and look at it and fix it. But it's not a you know, uh, all hands on deck uh, fix things. 10% in three days, uh, that means 100% in 30 days. So that's your burn rate of one. So it's not quite okay, but it's at least it's not gonna be the, the super high level critical rapid uh, reaction. There's one problem with uh, these burn rates is that if you have a burn rate of uh, two hours or even, you know, three days, What's happening is at the beginning, it raises like you're, hey, okay, it's been you know two percent in five hours or something, and then you're fixing the problem. But during the five hours, you you've been down, so there will be new hours. But you still be technically down due to this burn rate, because it's a sliding window, right? Until you finally go out of those five hours, and it use, it really shows that you're up, right? So the way to work around that is to have two windows. One that is during the two hour or five hour or you know uh, three days thing. And the other one is the equivalent but for five minutes. And you're saying is both of those windows are in alert, then I'm doing something. The cool stuff about the short window is that within five minutes of your resolution, this one will start to be back in the green and the alert will go down. So it's a nice way to get reactive into your resolution. So this is the crazy one. So if within five minutes, I'm using, you know, 13.44. So that's the ratio I was talking about the two hour in 2% uh, in one hour thing. And 99.95 is what we want to achieve. Okay. And then I'm compound it with the shorter, you know, uh, five minute window that says I, I do the same, but then I want to check within five minutes to be back in the green when I fix stuff. So when the budget is on fire, you again, you go to the instance, you open the dashboard to see whether you fix the problem or not. So you keep an eye on this one. So get a second monitor, you know, get your manager to make that happen. You go to the broker logs and you try to investigate what's going on. And then you can use Streamzy to roll over the pods in a safe way. Remember state, we'll mention that, like how you could lose state by killing the nodes a bit too fast. Uh, maybe the canary is a problem and check that one. Maybe it's a false alert in, in some fashion. Okay. And I'll hand it back to Clément for rebalancing fun. Yeah. So in 15 minutes. Yeah. So rebalance <laughs> in 15 minutes. That is going to be interesting. Yes. Yes. Um, yes, I'll try to find it and, and ship it. All right. Okay. Um, you're awake? Yeah? No headache? Soon. <laughs> the rebalance protocol. The rebalance protocol is one of the hardest, most complex parts of Kafka. And while you can try to ignore it, it will at some point bite very strongly. It's going to be very, very helpful. So you need to understand what's happening. It's especially true when you're on the cloud, uh, but it can happen anywhere. So remember that the partition is a unit of parallelism in Kafka on the consumer side. Uh, on the producer side, you have concurrent right to multiple partitions using these batches. And on the consumer side, uh, a number of partitions for a topic bonds to the maximum number of active consumers within a consumer group. So three partitions, three consumer and so on, so consumer group, one get assigned to each, and so on. One thing which is funny is that if you get more consumer inside your consumer group than partitions, like I have two partitions, three consumers in my consumer group, I have one consumer that won't do anything. 
but it's fine. It will continue call poor, or it will be considered dead, but you won't get any data. But it's fine. We will see. It can be useful. So the assignment, who is going to 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 uh, poll what is is important to understand and it's, it's key here. So imagine that I have a topic with four partitions, the so one, two, three, and I have three consumers. Okay, so the first one get assigned to two, the second one get assigned to one, and so on. So it's kind of weird to say, yeah, but we need to have the partition balance, but clearly here, my consumer one get the double, well, get a lot more work to do than the other one. But yeah, that's the fairness in Kafka. So you need to be aware of this. It can be tricky. Rebalancing is a coordination protocol, protocols, plural, uh, which will try to keep things running. So basically, um, it's a protocol where different brokers and consumers will cooperate to continue to work. So it happens when a consumer is leaving the group, willingly or not. So my crash, it might forget to call Paul and be considered dead or something like that. It will also happen when a consumer rejoin, like we restarted the pod or something like this. And in that case, he would have left and rejoined the group, which means that we need to do rebalance. And the rebalance is actually Redeciding who is going to be assigned to which partition. Basically, that's the only thing it tried to do. Um, so, well, the rebalance is a, is a process, it's a procedure. Um, um, and this definition is actually very interesting because it, uh, this definition is really about distributed systems, it's not really about uh, a Kafka. So, it says that. When you have a number of distributed uh, processes, uh, you need to coordinate so you can distribute a, distribute a set of resources among the members of that group. So it's really a group coordination protocol. We have plenty of them in other world, but Kafka went with their own kind of things. So how it works? So first, it's a two protocols, one uh, which is in the client and one which is in the uh, protocol itself. In the client, it's what we call the consumer embedded protocols, which will handle the assignation. And the Kafka protocol itself has a group membership protocol with a set of commands or messages, join, sync, heartbeat, leaves, and so on. It's all request response based. Because it's request response, there is timeout every time. If I send a request and I don't get an act or response within an acceptable limit, it will consider that the protocol failed or something like this. So the first thing we will do is join. Hey, I'm a new consumer. I want to join. Um, so remember this, all the data, uh, the, all the steps. So that's one of the steps. Find the coordinator. So it sends this find coordinator command to any random broker from the cluster. Um, and it will get a response, the broker coordinating the group. OK. Then it will say, hey, I want to join that group. So it's going to initiate the rebalance protocol, meaning that the coordinator says, hey, there is a new member in my group. So because there is a new member in the group, we need to reassign the partitions because maybe I have one, uh, one consumer getting two partitions, and now we get this new member, so we can, we, we can uh, uh, remove that overload. So when you initiate the rebalance protocol, there is a few settings that are important. Session.timeout.ms um, and max.pol.interval.ms, which the coordinator can, well, will use to know when the um, new consumers will be considered dead. So if, when we start the join, we will pass this data, which is our consumer uh, matrix, uh, consumer configurations, to the coordinator. The coordinator will use this data to say, if you don't call Paul again, if you don't say hi before this max Paul interval MS, I will evict you for the group, from the group, and restart a rebalance. Um, it can include clients' protocols and assignment strategy and so on, but that's really really advanced. When 
a new member arrive and send a join group command, each member of the group, of the group receive a join group response. So each member receives something, say, hey, we have a new member coming. Cool. So basically, it's how it works. So I send my thing, my, my join request, join group request, and the coordinator will send to everyone uh, um, uh, a response. Except that there is two kinds of response. There is the leader response, and there is the other response. The leader is that they pick one consumer of the group, generally the first one, but one consumer which will be considered as a leader, and that's the one which will perform the assignment. That's the one that will have the class that say, okay, I'm going to use that strategy to do the assignment between my members. So that one get a leader response. We will see the detail of that. The other one get a join response, but it's empty. Saying, yeah, we started a rebalance because we have a new member, but you are not concerned by it for now. It won't stay. So join group, and then everyone get a response. Um, then, um, again, request, reply, request, replied. All members need to send a sync group command. Even if you get an empty one, you need to send this sync group command. But the leader one that got the task to reduce the assignment need to send a sync group with the new assignments, saying that consumer will get that uh, uh, partition, this one, these ones, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, so others would just say, hey, we're still in the group, give me the new assignment. Once the coordinator has received all the um, uh, assignments uh, within an acceptable amount of time, um, it will send the assignment as response back in the other direction. So the coordinator will send back the assignments decided by the leader to all the members. Um, Interesting enough, the leader also gets the assignment. Well, he knows it's because he decided it. But he still gets the assignment because if something bad happened, failures or it got disconnected, he should only start pulling after that one. Uh, once the coordinator has received all the response, he sends the assignment. Yeah, is what I said. And then inside the client, there is a rebalance listener that will be called. So inside the consumer, you can override what we call a rebalance listener, which is uh, an interface, which will tell you, we will give you the new assign uh, um, partitions, the ones that you are, have been dropped, and the, and, uh, yeah, and the ones that have been removed. It's two different method calls. Um, and so you need to adapt yourself to this new set of assignments. The hard bit. Again, remember, at the beginning, when I join, when I send the join, I send a few metadata so the coordinator can keep track if I'm still alive or not. So basically, uh, it's done during the poll. So every consumer send periodically a hard bit part of the poll protocol, poll method. Um, and um, if you don't, you're considered dead, triggering another rebalance where it will send a join group, but with one less uh, um, uh, consumer. If you rejoin, another rebalance protocol. So, so far so good, except when the rebalance protocol starts failing. And it's a distributed system, so it will eventually fail. And then things start to be interesting. Um, the first thing is that this protocol is designed as a freeze the world effect, which means that when we have a consumer leaving the group, willingly or not, uh, well, we trigger rebalance protocol, we reduce the full rejoin, group syncing, and so on, round trip, and so on, reassignment. During that time, no one is allowed to pull records. So this can take some time. And for that time, you can't pull records. You can still write, but cannot pull. So it will create lag. Um, so if the consumer come back, 
new rebalance protocol and we restart it and run up again and freeze the world again. So if you have a lot of instability in your network or in your pod or something like that, you may end up in a situation where your topics will be written, 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 and your consumer will never be able to consume, not because they don't want or they crash, just because there is some network instability and the rebalance protocol is always running. Um, one of the cases where this is particularly true is when you are on Kubernetes. Because you do a rolling update, which is good, good practice, except that when you do rolling updates, you generally don't want to update everything at once, so you do one, then another one, then another one. So one leave, rebalance. One rejoin, rebalance. Another one leave, rebalance. Another join, rebalance. Another one leave, rebalance. And so on. So basically, you have a big period of freeze the world because you have a sequence of rebalance protocols that will happen. Six, if you have three uh, pods. So this is kind of annoying. Um, second thing is that distributed systems, may, we may have packet loss, something bad can happen. And so even if you still call Paul, something bad can happen and you missed one. So there is few reasons for that. Network outage, of course. Uh, Java as a garbage collector, which can be expensive at times. And so if it does a GC at a bad time uh, involving a long GC pause, you may lose, yeah, you may, your poll period is just passed and boom, you will consider dead. Well, your code is right. It's just a GC that kicked at the wrong time you have almost no control on this. So this will eventually happen. So, or yeah, you, you, your code is wrong and you don't call Paul frequently enough and then in that case, yeah. So basically, how it's computed, if you don't have any bits in session.timer.ms, you consider dead. And if Paul plus processing plus commit is greater than max.paul.interval.ms, you consider dead. So your, the consumers is not part of the group, rebalance again. So to improve that, there is a few things. In, uh, since Kafka 2.3, uh, we have something what we call static membership. Um, it tries to deal with transient failure where uh, consumers leave and join very quickly. Like, yeah, just network failures and yeah, something very, very fast. Or GC kind of things. So to, uh, to do that, uh, in addition to a group ID, to your, your, the consumer group name, you need to attach the group instance ID. And this uh, group instance ID must be unique in the uh, uh, consumer group. So that means that in a, it has a little bit more data on you, which means that if you are leaving, it won't trigger the rebalance immediately because it, it will say, hey, if you are rejoining with the same group instance ID, you will restart from that. So it's an extension of the rebalance protocol as we have seen it, where we have the ID in the join group and things like that. So in that case, uh, you join group with this, and if I run a sync group or something like that, I get the cached assignments, which means I don't, don't have to do the full rebalance things. It's pretty, pretty useful, especially in Kubernetes. Um, so what it means, it means that if you crash, Without sending a leave group, you have session.timeout.ms to come back on track. Configure it wisely, and you should be fine. Now, the eternal trade-off between availability and fault tolerance. Um, there is another rebalance protocol, which is named incremental cooperative rebalancing, um, which uh, happened in Kafka 2.3, at the same time as a static membership, actually. Um, and it's a change in the order of, of, the, of the messages in the rebalance to try to take uh, the, the dynamic world of the cloud a little bit better. So basically, it will try to reduce the freezer world. How to do that? It won't revoke partitions uh, to, to you if the coordinator say, well, you, will, you, still, uh, you are still assigned to the same partitions. So before, we start the rebalance, you're revoked from all your partitions, you are unallowed to pull anything, you get your new partitions, they might be the same, that's random, or that's decided for you, 
and you restart there. Here, it's a little bit better in the sense that the rebellion start, we will tell you, oh, these ones don't belong to you anymore, but the rest, everything that stay to you, you can continue pulling. So that reduce the freezer world to a uh, bare minimum. Um, so, oh, it's, the difference is the synchronization barrier moved up a little bit. So we have uh, the join group uh, on the on the right side, so, so with the incremental one, we have the join group, join response, sync group, new assignment, and here the synchronization barrier starts. Then we have the join group and so on. So we reduced the, um, the, the freezer world. We can continue pulling from the, uh, the partitions that are still assigned to us while the rebalance happens. That's avoid having lagging behind, uh, uh, which would be pretty bad. And that, yeah. And the rebalance listener, which is uh, the last side. So if you are using the bare Kafka API, you must implement this. Basically, it's the consumer side that will tell you, hey, you, um, you are not assigned to these partitions, or you are assigned to this uh, anymore, or you will be assigned to that. So it gives you the chance for a bit of time to clean up everything. So imagine I have, I'm assigned to a partition one, and I received a message inside my rebalance listener to say, hey, this doesn't belong to you, soon. And the soon is important, because then you have a bit of time where you can commit the last positions you have, you have processed correctly, Again, using your commit strategy. Uh, and so you will commit the later things, which means that the next consumer that will be assigned to that, to that partition will restart from that position. So it reduces the amount of duplicates. So you must do this. Uh, uh, the middleware we have in Quarkus does that for you. You can still do it. Uh, so, but yeah, basically it does that for you if you use it. And if you don't, you need to implement that yourself. Yeah, that's all. Ooh, so so yeah. Let me give that. And that's maybe you can move to the my new slides. All right. So this is the um, standard operating procedure structure that I was mentioning that I couldn't show you initially. So it's got the five sections. The first one is a description that says, okay, well we've got this alert because two brokers are uh, essentially on the same node. Uh, and they shouldn't, right? Uh, because we have availability concerns here. It makes a note that, you know, don't try to apply those things if you have instability under mean in sync replica because you might lose data by trying to fix the, the problem. So that's the first one. The second one is, okay, well, you need to have access to, so OSD means OpenShift dedicated. So it's one of the managed OpenShift, managed op Kubernetes we have. And the person that can usually have access to some sort of IDP, you know, back, back model here. Uh, back plan is not the back plan you know about it, it's our own stuff. Uh, go to the namespace and then, uh, you know, uh, make sure you're not doing upgrade for other reasons which might trigger this for some reason. And then here's the script you execute to find the list of um, brokers that you have that are unbalanced. Here you see the AA, A1, A1, C1 at the top right, I mean, that, uh, on the right side. So it's like two the Kafka 0 and 2 are on the same uh, availability zone and they shouldn't. So the next step, now that you have identified that, is to just uh, ask the pod to be deleted and recreated. I mean, and then Kubernetes will recreate it in a more balanced way according to the rules it has, right? Then, of course, you do the validation. So you run the same script to make sure it's okay. So it, it looks like, oh, of course it would, it's, it's fixed, right? No, 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 just make sure still. <laughs> uh, here, there's no specific troubleshooting aspect because if that doesn't work, then something else is wrong in the system and probably you want to escalate to, you know, in our case, uh, the engineering in one way. Okay, so that's the structure. So all of our uh, standard operating procedures follow that. Okay, so no, we're moving closer to like anticipating problems, right? Uh, and one aspect is like we don't have enough copy to have the uh, expectation of guarantees that Kafka is having in nomin nominal situations. Um, so remember, a quick reminder, if you have 
all of your brokers replication factor wise and they are all in sync, then you can read and write and life is perfect. If you have two out of three, you're starting, you're under replicated, but you're still fully able to read, write, but you've lost your one shot of survivability, right? You've lost one of the availability zone. Okay. I mean, if, if you lose one more, you, you will potentially lose state. If you add one out of three, you might still have all the states, but then Kafka goes into a degraded mode, then where it will, because we have mean in sync equals two, it will go in a degraded mode where it won't allow you to write anything. Okay, so that's, uh, might be okay for your app or it might be like a, a big blocker. And of course, zero is like, well, I don't know where the cluster is, what's going on here. So that's a, a fun one as well. So how to fix under replicated? Again, you get info from the various instance. You, you get the dashboard on the side to see when it's back up to not being under replicated. And you check the state of the brokers. Uh, maybe they are in a crash loop. Maybe their, their state, like the Kubernetes resource state is like it's failed, terminating, like you see where the source of the desynchronization is. And it might be one broker specifically that you will go and work on uh, specifically. And the restart might be the first way to get at it. It could be also that somehow it's not so much that the broker is down, but there is like a leader miscommunication happening. So you would decide to get rid of the leader and, and restart it or have the zookeeper equivalent of that. When you're under mean in sync replica, if you do something wrong, you will lose state. So you start to be rather careful and double checking what you're doing. Uh, but it's essentially the same, the same process. Okay, we'll, we'll go into some details afterwards. Offline might be like everything is offline. So it's more like an infrastructure level thing. Like why isn't Kuber uh, Kubernetes starting the thing if you're using Kubernetes? But otherwise it might be, I think there is a slide about that. So get that dashboard, right? That says here are the number of stuff in sync, not in sync, number of replicas I have and so on. So you know what's going on. In our case, it's across our fleet, uh, the staging fleet in this case. So uh, why a partition could be offline? As I said, it could be because like the brokers are not running. So of course that doesn't work, but it could be that all of the remaining replica, they don't, they are not in a position to Say, but connect back to the rest of the, to the leader essentially saying, hey, I'm here, but I'm out of sync. So they don't even send that sort of information. So it's felt as an offline partition from uh, the leader's point of view. Okay. And again, you look at the partitions that are offline, the brokers, and try and find whether it's one broker having all of those not right looking partitions going. And then you got your candidate for a restart. Okay, and you can force the controller re-election. Uh, I forgot how you do that. I think uh, there is a Kafka script somewhere in there, bin thing, I, I forgot. So how do you safely restart a broker? If you have no partition under mean in sync replica, you're good. And essentially you can kill one node and then have the thing happen and it will be transparent for the, the client minus a bit more load or, or the rebalancing that uh, Clement was mentioning if the broker has some leader aspect. If, you, if you're below that, if you're below the, uh, if you have the mean in sync replica and you might go below that, then check whether the broker is not a leader of any partition. If it's not a leader of any partition, it means at least there is one leader with the latest state. So you will not lose state. So here there is a script that you can get from the bin slash Kafka topic, uh, bin slash something in the Kafka, uh, the Kafka distribution. Um, and here it essentially tells you, well, this worker of Kafka zero uh, uh, is here. And then the leaders for partitions zero, one, and two are really one, one, and two. So it's not Kafka zero. So it's not a leader. I can safely delete it without losing state. If it's a leader, you can still remove it as long as there is at least one other mean in sync, I mean, other in sync replicas, because what's going to happen is that there'll be a leader re-election happening within Kafka to figure out. So it will slow stuff down a bit, but the data will be safe. Okay. 
And after that, it's like getting into the, it depends, sort of territory. So you really need to sit down and have the time to think um, about the problem. Okay, another kind of bad things happening. So it's the miscellaneous bad stuff you don't want to happen. Again, let's try to prevent that before seeing it happen. So one thing is uh, the SOP I just showed a bit earlier is actually about uh, an unbalanced cluster where too many processes are on the same node or the same uh, availability zone, right? So same availability zone, bad, same node, worse than bad, right? Uh, because if this one node goes down, which happens more often than a full AZ, uh, you're not good. So if you look at the example here, you see K3. If we lose that node or that availability zone, then means all of the state that is hosted on K3 is gone. So that's not good. If you look at K2, the green one, if you lose the AZ having the two nodes, then uh, you won't be able to write, but you can still read, right? So it's not the worst, but not, not great. So you need a thing to figure that out, and you need a thing to fix it. To figure that out, uh, essentially, you again have a very uh, left join complex from QL query that says, OK, for each for each Kubernetes, let's see where the pods are, and let's see if there is an imbalance between their availability zone and, uh, and the number of you know, brokers that I do have. You can have more than one broker in one AZ if you have a six broker uh, cluster, for example, so two in each, right? So that, that's a possible thing. And to bring everyone on, on board is the standard operating procedure I was showing. So you run the script to show where the imbalance is, and then you select the one broker you will decide to have down and back up. You check that it's in mean in sync replica and so on is fine. If you, if you don't know how to do that, then you can use StreamZ and label that pod for recycle. And StreamZ will do that job looking for the mean in sync replica and so on. So it's a bit safer than doing it by, by hand. And then you restart uh, things. OK? So if a disk gets full, then don't. Well, that's, the, that's the best answer. It, 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 is really, it could be really hard to recover from that. So what's happening is Kafka cannot write to its log system more stuff. So it cannot accept any new message and commit it and flush it to disk. Or at some point, there'll be, there is a back pressure to say, trying to commit to this, but it doesn't work. So there's a back pressure in, within um, Kafka. And if somehow there is a bit of a weakness in the IO handling process, then you might just be in an unstable state, or you can crash. And the worst case is like you try to restart, and it tries to fix because the, the log system is in an unsafe mode, uh, like maybe it's only half written or something and you need space to fix that, and you don't have space, and you crash, and so on. So good stuff. Um, so don't make that happen, not only for Kafka, but also for Zookeeper. So Kafka is like proportional to your data. Zookeeper is proportional to your metadata, let's say, number of topics, number of partitions. So it's a different linearity. Uh, of course, your observability stack is a funny one, so let's make sure you don't uh, overflow your observability stack. Right? Try to avoid to be there. And the way to do that is to have alerts, the one that is like hair on fire alert, and the other one is like, well, it's going to be a hair on fire if you don't do anything. So the second one, uh, which is probably the one you should focus on to not be in the hair on fire situation, it's a warning. And it says, assuming linear progression, within four days, that file system will be full. OK? So it's good enough to set a ticket and raise it with a high enough alert. And then somebody within those four days at working time hour, normal working time hour, will look at it and find a solution. The, the one above is like 3% remaining. You know, I'm about to be in a bad state. So go at it right away. Find a solution, right? And it could be as bad as like, let's, let's shut down the network until we figure stuff out. It depends on what you feel is your SLO and your 
um, contract with your, your users, your customers. So how do you fix a Kafka broker that is full? So try not to do it, but otherwise, if you have a, vi well, if you can increase the volume space, at least temporarily, do that. That gives you space to try and work on the recovery, get the Kafka restarted and work on the, on the more permanent solution. Um, the other solution is literally to go to the, the logs and try to figure out the old segments you might not need. And, you know, it's a literally open heart surgery, so I would not recommend that. Uh, again, to prevent it, go to the alert, but also have a quota mechanism that will start to slow down the production of messages or even stop them before you reach the effective file system to full problem. So that's the quota we, I was describing before. Um, and the solution is you can add more brokers. If it's like evenly full, then you add more brokers. The partition will even out to all of those additional brokers, and you will have more free space per broker. The other reason it could be that it's very imbalanced. There is like three partitions that are using 80% of the, the space, and they happen to be on the same broker. So how about we move them and even stuff around? And that's using cruise control to figure out a plan to rebalance it in the best possible uh, way and then execute the operation. Okay, uh, I think it's back to you, Clément. Yeah, with cube one. Cube one, okay. We got 15 minutes. So yes. So, so, so short. Very quickly is how do I, um, or how can I use the Kafka that Emmanuel set up? So basically, as a consumer, as a, with a Kafka client, you need to configure the bootstrap server, which is the entry point. This is relatively easy. The hard part is the security part. Of course, we don't want anyone to access your Kafka broker, so we need to uh, configure the authentication and things like that. So there is several ways to do that, but what we recommend is to use SSL, t SSL or with a OAuth Beaver. We will see two variants. Basically, that means uh, two things. That means that the transport between you as your application and the broker will use TLS encryption. Uh, that means that you cannot be sniffed and things like that. Um, this is a good thing. And the second thing is that in addition to that, we will use SISL authentication plain. So basically, username, password. Great, but not that great, because if the password gets leaked, it can, be a it can be problematic. Well, Kafka is based on Java. Uh, and uh, how to do that in Java is to use a JAS uh, configuration, so the plain logging module, which is uh, an interesting way to configure, because you by default, the first time you do this, you will have a problem. It won't work. Why? A space. You're missing a space, or you have an extra space. It's like YAML, but before YAML. <laughs> um, basically, why? It's because of this. So you need to set the Kafka bootstrap server. OK, so typically, this will be one operated by Red Hat, uh, by Managed Kafka. Then I need to set the security protocol to SISL underscore SSL, um, the SSL mechanism to plane, and then you use the uh, org, Apache, Kafka, command security plane, plane logging module. And ex everything after that is case sensitive, space sensitive, and so on. So it says that it's required, required. so you must authenticate. You pass the username and password. OK? Relatively simple. However, if that account, if it gets revoked or something like that, until the connection is shut down and the application restarts, it will still have access to your Kafka, which might not be what you want. So there is another way of doing this, which is the OAuth Beaver, which is not supported by default in Kafka. You need a specific class uh, to do that, but well, it's what we recommend. It has a it's a, the control is more fine-grained because, well, it's all these token things, so you need to refresh periodically. So if your token gets revoked, yeah, it's, it's much better. Um, 
It need a more, slightly more complex configuration, but not that much. You need at least the OAuth token endpoint URI, which is where your SSO endpoint, basically. And you need the SISL login callback handler class, which is a class that will handle the SSO authentication, the refresh, and things like this. So you configure it like this. Security protocol still the same, but the mechanism this time is using OAuth Beaver. So the module name is a little bit different. The client ID, the secret, so it's not really username and password, but yeah, it's a, uh, ID and secret. And then you need to pass the token and point URI where you are, is your SSO. Uh, and you need to set the, the JAS client or OS login callback handler. So basically in that case, if you add, for example, this dependency, then we have a OAuth mechanism to authenticate your client. It's more fine grained it's more bulletproof, it's, yeah, and it's avoid leaking a password everywhere because it's just keys. Uh, can be complicated. So there is another thing that exists and start to be uh, growing a little bit. It's what we call a service binding operator. So if you are in Kubernetes, uh, and in Quarkus, if you add that dependency here, uh, there is equivalent in other uh, framework, I believe, um, then it will automate the connection with your, your broker. So you don't have to configure anything. Basically, uh, you will create a Kafka connections, it will be there, and then you will deploy the applications. The application will see, oh, there is Kafka connection, and there is some magic happening behind the scenes that will inject the configuration directly inside your application, and you don't have to do anything. Looks magic like that. It's a set of operators, complex one, uh, but that does that. So it injects the bootstrap server, security protocol, SS, SISL, JAS, and so on. And you know what? No white space problem with that approach. Hmm. That's cool. Well, you may have other problems, but not that one. Um, so how it works, it's, it's, it's really how Kubernetes works. It's going to mount files, we detect them, and things like that. So it's, it's pretty cool. And it exists for Kafka, but also for database and things like that. Uh, we, I just wanted to mention it for Kafka. Uh, so yeah, basically how it works, uh, we have the service binding operators, uh, uh, you have your uh, uh, service connection, so Kafka, Postgre, Mongo, we have more right now. Um, so service binding operators will find the one you need, will bind, will mount the configurations, and Quarkus will automatically read it, inject it, and you're good. Um, yeah, uh, wrong. Oh, we have seven minutes, so you do Rosac? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll try something with you, so I think it would be good to have uh, Solid five minutes for questions at the very least, yep. like uh, that is common. So this one is really um, to explain the balance between um, the uh, managed Kafka versus uh, stuff you do on your own. So I'll go real fast. Um, um, you know, there are pros around control and cost center, and frankly, the installation is quite easy initially. Uh, but then when you start to get bigger, then you start to need to think about the SLO, the ops team, all of the stuff we've described here. So the balance here is an interesting. Whatever the provider you're choosing, it's like a managed something has some you know, interesting values. So that's what uh, the, the name is long for the Apache Kafka trademark thing, but that's, that's the name of the service and it's, it's available. So what I ask for you is go to redhat.com slash Kafka, look, create the account if you need to, and then Look at it, play with it for, you know, with a free 24 hour instance. It's got a very nice UI that is very focused on the developer. So um, we find it extremely useful. People that have, you know, onboarded really enjoyed the, uh, the experience. You get your Kafka in five minutes, it's up and running. We got the quick starts, whether you use Kafka, uh, you know, I don't know, Quarkus, Node.js, Spring, you know, whatever. We got a lot of those. Metrics are exposed, and then there is a uh, Prometheus backend um, attached to it. And we got a CLI that is also dev-centric. So that's uh, like the builder, the person is the architect and dev, a set of devs, you know, uh, that's, that's the, the target here. And we have side services like connectors to connect in and out, including change data capture via Debezium. And we have a service registry, so we, with some people, we discussed the notion of schema, JSON, Avro, Protobuf, so service registries, this where you store those schemas and don't have to store them on every single message. And I'll stop there uh, and let's start questions. So before we start questions... Let's uh, not start questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
we, we will share the, the, all the slide decks, and there is a lot more slide decks that will be shared, especially one for the third day, uh, clients' metrics, clients' monitoring, and things like that, because, yeah, yeah it's only three hours. We can, you can yeah. speak for a full day, but you probably will die before that. But <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, so you will get more than what you have seen here. But, yeah, no questions. Yes. Yes. Is there a use case where you can, uh, where you need, where you will configure more or have more consumers than partition in consumer group? Yes, that will to reduce the downtime uh, if um, if uh, if some someone crash or something like that, because the rebalance protocol will reapply immediately with an existing set of of consumers that either one will pick. Uh, the some works and you avoid uh, doubling the work on one of the consumer. Doubling the work on one of the consumer can have big consequences in terms of CPU and memory hitting the limits and then things can really get bad. So yes, there is some use case. It's, what? it's relatively rare that we do that, but yeah, it can happen. Yeah, what I recommend is more like uh, go a bit overboard on the partitions, like not to millions, because uh, depending on which Kafka versions, it might not be supported well, but go above what your expectation of scale. And then you will have uh, consumers that you know handle several of them, and then you can scale up that way. So that's uh, that would be the more traditional way to think about things. Yes. Kafka is a dependency of, of your microservice. You cannot be more available than Kafka is. However, this is difficult uh, because of latency. So if, if there's a latency on end-to-end, -end, uh, how do you measure that? Maybe with synthetic checks, but there's not a clear... Uh, okay. So I heard two questions. So, so the first one is... Uh, you can only be as available as uh, as your dependencies, right? So the more you have a direct connection to other stuff, then your uptime will be, well, your effective availability will be lower than the the sum of the availability, uh, not the sum, but the compounded availability of the other ones. It's not necessarily true in Kafka because the producers will batch and retry. So your availability on your Kafka application might be a little bit higher than, than Kafka because of this yeah. retry mechanism. But but yeah, for latency. Yeah, for yes. latency so yeah. So that's the second question. Yeah. By the way, the general workaround is you you write to at least, I mean, you, you try to not have one dependency, but two that you can flag in between, and then you can get your SLO higher even though the underlying system is. But that's a generic thing that might not apply in specificities. So I didn't fully get your latency aspect. Uh, I know the way we do it because we have it's really client facing is we using we are using the canary as our way, but it's not end to end from a full system point of view. Uh, you, you probably can measure the end to end if you're like the person handling the system globally, but you will need uh, the measure of the latency in between each to really be able you know, to be in a position to zoom in to know where where you start having problems, like a queue filing up or something like that. I'm not sure I'm answering really your so question, in, but... In right to messaging, we have open tracing, uh, open telemetry tracing enabled. Mm -hmm. So basically, you inside your tracing mechanism, you can see, oh, I went from this HTTP and wrote this Kafka message and then process there and there and there. So you can see the end-to-end. -end. However, because of how Kafka works and because you may consume your records one month after they have been emitted, which is fine. It might not be useful, always useful. So it really depends on the system, but yeah, this tracing may give you some ideas. Otherwise, let's try and do it offline. And maybe yeah. one last question, a short one. If I see anything. Yes. Uh, uh, End of uh, and we have uh, one on the back too. Yeah, yeah. go ahead first. Sorry? 
Can you turn off rebalancing? Ah, can you turn off rebalancing? Uh, yes, uh, there is one way where you don't do subscription, you don't do assignment, you do everything yourself. So you can do that. It's not simple. But yeah, you can do that. So you will use Kafka directly with, with well, you will remove all yeah. this part and do everything yourself. And the static partition assignment is the, the it's a first step, yeah. really, that simplifies already a lot the, the thing. Uh, Assuming you can go back within a reasonable time up period. And, and the only thing to, to enable static uh, rebalance protocol is to just add the consumer ID. That's all. It's, it's automatic after that. So try that because going bare Kafka without any assignment, anything, yeah, that can be really tricky. Yes, I could avoid to stop the world if you come back in a acceptable amount of time. All right, we're out of time, but we'll be either on stage or if we're kicked out, just outside for people that have follow-up questions. I'm yeah, and this afternoon that. I will be at the Red Hat booth. So if you have any yes. follow-up questions, we will be there. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you.